Throughout the over 50 year history of hip hop, there has unfortunately been countless of stories of rappers who have passed away tragically young. Artists like Biggie, Tupac, Big L, and Charisma all passed away very young in the 90s. This trend would continue in the modern day with rappers like LA Capone, Mac Miller, Pop Smoke, Lil Peep, and Juice World all having lost their lives and had their careers cut short due to various circumstances. However, one name would stand above them all, that being Capital Steez. Capital Steez unfortunately passed away right as his career was beginning. See, most artists at least have a handful of mixtapes or albums under their belt before their untimely passing. But Steez only had one official mixtape with a handful of loose singles floating around the internet as his discography. Capital Steez was an artist with infinite potential as he had sharp lyrical skills filled with complex rhyme schemes, double entendres, and a laid back charismatic personality on the mic. He also had a whole crew of MCs following behind him, which he would call Pro Era. This included rapper and future actor Joey Badass. Steve was also one of the founders of Pro Era and the founder of the Beast Coast movement as well. But Steve also had a set of spiritual beliefs that distinguished him from his contemporaries in the early 2010s that could simply be summed up as New Ageism. However, with seemingly the world at his fingertips and having so much going on for himself, Capital Steve would tragically take his own life on December 23rd, 2012 at the young age of only 19 years old. But how could this happen? How could a buzzing rapper with a bright future ahead of him take his own life like this? His death has been shrouded in mystery and has been the subject of many conspiracy theories with people not believing that he took his own life, instead believing that he might have been killed. But over 10 years later, the question still stands, how could this have happened? This is what I'll explore in this video, taking a deep dive into Steez's life, his come up in hip hop and the circumstances surrounding his death. As one of my all time favorite rappers, I will make sure to tell his story in the most respectful way possible, making sure that I do right by Steez, his friends, and his family. So, with all that being said, this is the full story of Capital Steez. <laughs> Capital Steez was born Courtney Everall Duar Jr. on July 7th, 1993 to two Jamaican parents. He was the only boy and the youngest of four with three older sisters named Tanya, Tamara, and Jamelia. Steez was commonly known as Jamal among his friends and family. His father, Courtney Duar Sr., passed away on March 18th, 1996 at the young age of 38 when Steez was about two years old. Although his cause of death is unknown to the public, Steez would later allude to his death on Free the Robot where he would rap up a sugar egg, people out pushing crack, and I lost my father figure because of that. As someone who grew up with a complex relationship with my father, with him often being in and out of the house, I could only imagine how losing a parent so young would have affected Steez and his upbringing. Growing up in Brooklyn, Steez was exposed to hip hop at an early age, and soon Steez would form his own hip hop duo with his best friend, Jakiri Jack called Saturday Morning Breakfast, where they would perform their raps in school, and soon this would progress into them downloading instrumentals off LimeWire and recording their raps in Steez's attic in his Flatbush apartment. During this time, Steez was calling himself Blowtorch and Jack was Excalibur. But as things do when you're first learning the tools of the trade, things move fast, and eventually they would change their duo name and respective rap names. By 2009, Jakiri Jack was now calling himself Jack the Rhymer, and Steez officially changed his name to Jay Steez, with J standing for Just Another Youngin. They would then change their group name to The Third Kind as well, and on April 2nd, 2009, they dropped their first and only mixtape together, called The Yellow Tape, both at the age of 16 years old. The production, for the most part, consisted of beats they found on the infamous pirating site LimeWire. This included classic beats like Troy by Pete Rock and CL Smooth, 93 to Infinity by Souls of Mischief, Sulfur King by Danger Doom, Skills by Gangstar, and even Plastic Beats by Gorillaz. And that's not even all of the classic beats they rapped over on this tape. But for the most part, this big tape was Jack the Rhymer and Steve showing off their skills as rappers, with not too many hooks or choruses featured. However, they can be topical at times. Both Steez and Jack show some serious skills on this tape as the songs are packed with metaphors, similes, and tightly packed multiple syllable rhymes. For example, this line from Steez on Sulfur King where he raps, quote, Peep the rhyme, used to do this in the leisure time. Read the fine print, I read the fine, writing easy lines. This showed early signs of his promise as a lyricist, and even if this tape was mostly filled with braggadocious, non-sequitur style raps from Steez and Jack, they still held their own and came through with a lot of personality and skill at such a young age. 
which is very impressive. And I recommend you check this tape out if you want to hear what Steve sounded like when he was first developing the sound. But even though this was the only tape as a third kind together, they would continue to collaborate throughout Steve's life. Around 2009 was when Steve started to get a buzz in his local area, becoming known as the kid who rapped and rapped exceptionally well. Many of his old freestyles, either of him chilling with his friends, hanging outside, or at home when he merged. These early freestyles really showed that he was honing his craft as a rapper and started to gain some recognition in his local area. But as an artist trying to get your feet wet, this is a good start, especially at the age Steez was at during this time. Also, Steez's friends say that he was a person who made friends very easily, and you could definitely see this with Pro Ira later in his life. He was always smiling and laid back. People said he had an impeccable sense of style, as Steez would admit this on his first appearance on the NYU student podcast with Joey Badass, saying that he had a crazy hype beast and sneakerhead phase around this time. He took pride in the way he dressed, and you could definitely see this with Steez and Pro Ira style a few years down the line. But Steez did not slow down after releasing the Yellow Tape and he would continue to write and record songs, many of which would surface later online. Before Pro Era was born, Steez was actually working on a solo mixtape that had the working title of Beast Without the Hype, which came from Steez's clothing company called Straight Steez. Apparently he would wear a hoodie that said Beast Without the Hype on it, and Steez became known for this at school, so naturally it would become his mixtape title. A lot of songs would emerge after Steez's death, and without a clear date as to when it was recorded. So it's hard to tell which songs were recorded at which times. But I can safely assess that some of these songs were recorded around this time period. M.I.A. is one of those songs and one of my personal favorites. This is a song about Steve's experiences with love at the time and his lack of understanding when it came to the subject. Very relatable to me when I was younger. A song that had an official release was called Stars and it was slated to be on this tape. This was an ode to his mom where he was essentially saying that he had the skills to make his dreams a reality and that he was rapping for her. The song even came with a music video directed by co-founder of Pro Era, Powers Pleasant. However, on Steez's second appearance on the NYU student podcast, Steez would explain that he was still developing his sound. So while writing for this project, he would add songs, take other songs out, and realize that these songs really didn't represent him as a person. And eventually, he'd come up with the concept for American Corruption, which would be his first official mixtape but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it was during this time in his life while attending Edward R. Murrow High School that Steez would find another rapper who was two years younger than him, but already showed a lot of promise. And that rapper was Joey Badass. It's important to note that Edward R. Murrow is a high school that places a great emphasis on the creative arts, as they have an insane list of alumni that includes MCA from the Beastie Boys, legendary artist John michel Basquiat, and typo negative vocalist Peter Steele, among others. But this is where the core of Pro Era would meet and get their inspiration to form a crew. According to his second interview on NYU Student Radio, Steve said that Joey knew who he was and their acquaintances who would say what's up to each other in the hallways. We've all been there before, right? But one day, Joey uploaded a freestyle onto his YouTube channel. This video is actually still up today, and at the time he was rapping under the name J-O-V. This freestyle would give Joey some notoriety in school and with his friends, and one day Steez went up to Joey asking him if that was you freestyling on YouTube. Joey was admittedly ecstatic, and Steez would keep an eye on Joey's progression, stating in that same NYU interview quote, Joey was a fan of mine at, at the time, you know what I mean? Oh, wow. Like, Joey was like, yo, Steez. I'm like, yo, what up, homie? Like, I used to see him in the hallway, and... I mean, Joey's about two, two, a year or two years younger than you, right? Yeah, yeah, we went to mall together, but I didn't know... I, me and him didn't become really close friends until, like, the year that, um, that pro era started. Oh, okay. Yeah, but he was just, like, a homie of mine that got sort of in the hallway, and it, it just started getting better and better, and it was just, like... Mm -hmm. Potential. Potential energy, P.E. Soon after this, Joey and Steve would start to get closer and began to grow as artists. Then one day in March of 2011, after Steve's played a show at a soul food restaurant, Pro Era was formed. Inspired by a cipher that happened after the show, Steve's and Powers Pleasant said, we might as well start a group and soon things would grow fast from there. The core that formed Pro Era at this time were MC's Capital Steve's, Joey Badass, and CJ Fly, and producer Powers Pleasant. Edward R. Murrow High School would actually give their students OTPAs, which were free periods that the students 
could use in whatever way they wanted to. The early Pro Hour members would use these free periods to rap all the time, either showing their verses that they just wrote or freestyling with powers a lot of the time on piano, the drums, or banging on the tables. These freestyle sessions are where the pros would further hone their skills as rappers and their sound would really begin to develop and take shape. It was during this time period when Pro Era were freestyling at school that the founder of management company Cinematic Music Group Johnny Shipes discovered the freestyle that Joey Badass uploaded onto YouTube and reached out to him. See, Cinematic Music Group only had a handful of artists on their roster at that time, those being Smoke Dizza, Big Crit, and Nipsey Hussle. Sipes saw the potential in Joey Badass very early and wanted to sign him. However, Joey Badass was only 16 at the time. So Shipes and Joey's mom worked out a sort of informal agreement to where Joey could work with Cinematic without signing any contracts. And eventually, when they were ready, they would ink an official deal. But see, according to the Fader article on Steez's life that acted as a obituary in a lot of ways, Johnny Sharks was only really interested in working with Joey, even saying, quote, man, you should focus on yourself. But Joey was adamant that Pro Era was a part of any deal that they worked out, as he felt that he was a part of something special. This is when Pro Era went from kids honing their skills as artists and freestyling around their school to having the backing of a management company and promotional team, which is a huge step up. While this was all happening for Pro Era, Steve was really starting to come into his own, not only as a rapper, but when it came to his personal beliefs and spirituality. So Steve has been characterized as a curious and very inquisitive type of person. So as he started to grow and come into his own as a rapper, he would also start to question the world around him and his place in it. I'm not sure exactly what religion, but according to the Fader article, Steez grew up in a religious household where they would go to church regularly. Soon he would start to question it as many of us do growing up, and Steez started to get an understanding of his place in the world. According to close friends, by the time he got to high school, Steez concluded that Jesus was black, not white, so he identified more with Rastafarianism, with him and his friends saying, jaw this and jaw that and all that type of stuff. But this was also when Steve started getting more into smoking, smoking weed in particular. Eventually, while diving deep into self-discovery, as many of us do, Steve came across the Spirit Science YouTube channel. Now this channel would dive deep into lessons about the fundamentals of spirituality, specifically ones that could be categorized as New Ageism. Actually, my older brother showed me their video on Astral Projection in 2012 when I was like 13 years old which is surreal to think about, and it's crazy how these type of things come full circle. Now, New Ageism is pretty hard to sum up, but I'm gonna try my very best right now. So it is characterized as a spiritual or religious movement that grew in popularity during the 1970s in the Western world. Its highly eclectic and unsystematic structure makes it hard to define, but practitioners see it as highly spiritual, and they place a great emphasis on unifying the mind, body, and soul through practices like meditation, affirmation, and manifestation. Energy plays a great role in New Ageism as they adopted the chakra system from Hinduism and Buddhism, which is defined as energy points throughout the body that correspond to bundles of nerves, major organs, and areas of our body. So many practitioners place an emphasis on balancing the chakras to stay in alignment. This only scratches the surface of New Age practices as people practice it to varying degrees. Some dive deeper into it going into the field of astral projection and out-of-body experiences, as we'll get into later. Steez in particular saw himself as an indigo child, which is a concept in New Ageism that is defined as children or people who are believed to possess special, unusual, and sometimes supernatural traits or abilities, like high intuition or high intelligence. Many believe that indigo children are misdiagnosed or heavily linked with having ADHD. One thing I would like to note is that Pro Era was coming up in the Bloomberg era of New York City, where the disparity between the lower and upper classes was obvious and hard to ignore. According to the Fader article on Steez's life, Steez and fellow PE member Dirty Sanchez were a victim of stop and frisk a total of seven times together. For those who don't know, stop and frisk was a law in New York City where the police can stop and search people if they had, let's just say, reasonable cause to do so but many times it would just add to the issue of racial profiling in the city as many of those who were stop and frisk were black or Hispanic kids. So this led to pro-era as a whole and especially Steve's adopting an anti-authoritative position and a clear disdain for the government which was reflected in their music. 
This combination of themes in Steez's music and his personal life led to many conspiracy theories on Steez's tragic demise, but we'll get into that a little later. Steez was enamored with this new knowledge, and I should note that his personal beliefs when it came to spirituality has been characterized as having elements of Egyptian mysticism, numerology, synchronization, and emphasis on frequencies, New Ageism, and its various practices. He would also put his friends from Pro Era onto all this as according to the Fader article, they would have full on group meditation sessions at the park, which is honestly really fire. But this new outlook on the world would be reflected in his music and writing as his early songs were mostly lyrical onslaughts with some other songs about love here and there, but Steez would begin to find balance combining his wordplay and complex lyricism with his views and even criticism of the world that we live in. Some early songs where you could start to notice this difference in Steez were in the early days of Pro Era. One such song was Blood and Blood Out by Lost Productions featuring Steez, and honestly, this verse is easily on par with survival tactics. As Steez criticizes our leaders, frankly pointing out their hypocrisies when he raps, quote, I pledge allegiance to classrooms, I'm missing teachers Go ahead and cut some more jobs, I don't think they need it Spending money on sex scandals and strip teasers And these are selfish motherfuckers that we pick to lead us They spurging on the murderers and burglars But I don't really think our foolish youth deserve to learn enough He also boldly claims that these are the wise ambitions of a young stoner And that he's bumping that American terrorist finger to America And that he ain't scared of anything Shout out to my boy from high school who told me this was Steez's verse And showed me this verse in lunch in high school if you're watching this, shout out to you, man. But another song that would show this changing Steez and also show him going down a more personal route was the song Negus, released on July 11, 2011. The beat used the same sample used on Yonkers by Tyler the Creator. And this song also makes Steez's knack for punchlines and wordplay with them telling bits and pieces of his personal story and approach to writing he would hone on later songs. But Negus would explore the doubt and prejudice he faced from teachers growing up his stepfather being a quote, functional addict, which I have no real way of verifying, and his ambitions as a rapper, among other things too. Negus is a clear highlight in Steez's catalog that showed the progression he was going through as a rapper, and that he was also reflecting on his experiences growing up as well. You could clearly hear the hunger in his delivery on this one. But now would be the best time for me to get into the significance of the number 47, and what that meant for Steez and the other pros. I'm not sure how or exactly when Steez came up with the concept for this, but for Steez and the pros, 47 was the perfect representation of balance in the universe, representing the tension between the fourth and seventh chakra, the fourth chakra being the heart, and the seventh chakra being the crown, representing the mind. Now this is a deep and very insightful concept for an 18 year old kid to come up with, and to me, it's very philosophical in a way. As many philosophers I've come across cover the tension between humans more emotional side and their logical one, with both always being at odds with one another. But eventually Steve would create a logo and make stickers. Now the logo bears a striking resemblance to the Nazi symbol with Steve adopting the white circle and red background. This was intentional as Steve wanted to both grab people's attention and take back the swastika as it represented peace in many Eastern religions. The 47 sticker would also be the subject of an investigation from their local NYPD precinct as they would put their stickers around their high school which was around an orthodox Jewish neighborhood. But according to the Fader article, the NYPD eventually stopped their investigation after discovering it was the logo for a quote, band. Lastly, when speaking about spirituality and starting to add that into his music, Steve would say, quote, but basically it aligns like a human consciousness with with light, color, sound, and every every aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So like, I've gotten that deeply into understanding the human mind where I know how to, to channel my energy to someone's emotions rather than their intellect. So I get through the heart rather than the mind. Mm. How you, like, how are you gonna be able to reach them though? I mean, just my frequencies, you know? Pro Era was spent 2011 and the early part of 2012, dropping singles consistently from the multiple artists that made up the crew at the time, like Joey Badass, Capital Steve, CJ Fly, Diamond Lewis, Kirk Knight, and producer Bruce Lee Kicks all dropped their earliest singles on the official Pro Era YouTube channel during this time. One of my favorites being Soul Fly that had Joey Steez and CJ Fly on it. Steez's verse is another notable verse that marked his changing subject matter with lines like, 
They say the world is filled with good people, so why we fall victim to the root of all evil? But on Valentine's Day of 2012, Pro Era would drop their first official mixtape called The S Tape. With the name and its release date, this tape was solely focused on topics like love, relationships, and how do I put this? Like making love if I'm keeping it above. This mixtape was a group project, however, this tape serves as more of a way to showcase the individual artists of Pro Era instead of fully showing their group dynamic. This is actually a pretty common practice with groups releasing their first project in this style, as Odd Future did this with the Odd Future tape, Brockhampton also did it with All American Trash, and Freestyle Fellowship did it too with To Whom It May Concern back in the 90s. Like instead of these songs being pro era songs, they were, for example, stylized as Flying Low by Capital Steez featuring CJ Fly and Tina Apex. This is still very early on in Pro Era's career, so while some artists are still developing their sound and styles as MCs, other artists are more experienced and you could see this on the S tape. Highlights on this tape include Panty Raid by Joey Badass, Emotionless Thoughts by Capital Steez, which is a song where he goes into detail about his shortcomings in love, reminiscing about a past relationship and how he's being framed as a bad guy, but also Synchronized Ecstasy is another highlight on the tape. For the most part, this tape flew under the radar, but later that month, Pro Era would take the rap world by storm when they dropped the music video for their song, Survival Tactics. So Survival Tactics came about in the summer of 2011. As Joey Badass would explain in an interview on Genius, he originally wrote his verse to Monkey Suit by Mad Villain, and the next day, he would rap the verse for Steez in the cafeteria. Steez really liked the verse, but told him that he should rap the verse over the styles of Beyond Beat. So after school that day, they went back to Joey's crib and recorded their verses. Steez commented that he should put more energy into his verse, telling him, let me show you how it's done. Then Steez recorded his verse in one take, which is something he was known for doing pretty often. Then Joey recorded his verse again with a lot more energy, and that's the version that we know of today. When speaking about how survival tactics came about on the NYU student podcast, Joey Badass would say, quote, I remember, it's crazy, I remember like the exact day Sorry, he sent it. me the beat like on Facebook mm -hmm. and like, I heard it and like, all right, like at that time I was like, my style was changing and I was just getting better and better progressing so fast. Mm -hmm. Like when he sent the beat, it was just like, it just hit me. I was like, all right, come on, bro, we got to do it. And like, he sent me the beat, I already had the verse like an hour later. Mm -hmm. yeah. What happened was, in fact, he had his verse already. When I played oh, I did, I had, I, I yeah, had it, yeah, it was. I didn't have it finished. That's what it was. My homie Begare, he had made this track for me called Negus, and I was like, "Yo, you gotta send me some old school hip hop because that's the times he grew up on." So he sent me the song. And I was like, "You know, it's cool." And then, eventually, I sent. I was at Joey's house. We were trying to record. I played this, and he spit that verse, and I came up with like eight bars that night. And he really, he was like, "Yo, we gotta finish this," and then like okay. we didn't even think that was gonna be. The number one track, and then yeah, Powers, we put it in the Powers was the like, my, Powers was just like, yo, f everything else we're doing, we need to record this. This is gonna be crazy, yeah. and like, <laughs> we just took his word for it. We were, we were both like, but like, what made him think that it was like gonna be a big song? Like, I guess he just felt it. Like, mm. yeah, Powers got. We didn't even hair. feel it like the way he felt it. Like, mm -hmm. he just told us like, yo, get I, this done. I, 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 Powers like, thinks oh. like an entrepreneur, so I, I can relate to yeah. him. Mm. He was just like, Business, this is man. going. <laughs> like I said, like the mainstream, you gotta make yourself more commercial and presentable for other people. And mm -hmm. he's one that thinks like that. He thinks like, yo, you gotta worry about the masses, not mm. just you. Yeah. Cinematic must have felt the same way as they would eventually shoot a music video for it. But it's important to note that Survival Tactics was actually written, recorded, and released originally in the summer of 2011. And it was when the music video dropped that the hip hop world would begin to take notice. Dropping a week after Pro Era released the S tape, Survival Tactics would make a huge splash in the blogs. For one, it was shocking to see kids so young in their late teens spinning with that much skill. I mean, even till this day, Joey Badass in 1999 still gets compared to Nas' Illmatic, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. It was the first time that people saw kids from New York rapping in a style that was before their time. Rapping in a style and over beats that were more reminiscent of the golden era of hip hop was something relatively new back in the early 2010s, with rappers from that time either making trap, drill, or cloud rap with a more southern influence. So this song essentially made a lot of the hip hop world turn its head and take notice of Pro Era and everything that they were about. Both Joey and Steve rapped with confidence, charisma, 
and skill that was quite frankly incredible for their age. The lyrics and imagery seen on the video reflects their anti-establishment views as the whole of pro-era marched through Wall Street and abandoned buildings in the financial district in New York City with panda bear ski masks, smoking blunts, and rapping behind an American flag. Steve's actually wears his Beast Without the Hype crew neck in some of these shots. But what Survival Texas did for the careers of Pro Era, Capital Steve's, and Joey Bass cannot be understated, as the video would feature heavily on blogs that Joey and Steve's used to frequent as fans like Two Dope Boys, among others. Also, several artists would tweet out the song showing love to the crew like Mac Miller's manager at the time, Lincoln Park's Mike Shinoda, and underground rapper Apathy. On the blogs and in the comment sections, there were a lot of discussion over the little B jab where Steve says they say hard work pays off until the bass god don't quit his day job, and over the similarities that they had with legendary hip hop group Public Enemy, you know, with the whole PE thing and Joey wearing a Pittsburgh P hat. Also, some people thought Joey's line where he says, We don't give a F as long as we collect our peso, y'all collect pesos, was a jab at ASAP Rocky. But he cleared that up in the interview with NYU Student Podcast. But the video would reach over 100,000 views in just a few weeks. This was the beginning and marked the start of Pro Era really making their way into the industry. But for Steez in particular, this would mark a difficult adjustment for him personally. It was during this time that Joey, Steez, and the rest of Pro Era started to do interviews that would sometimes include ciphers. This was also the time when Steez would begin to sharpen his image as a rapper, as he would ride his bike all across Brooklyn, everywhere he went to try to lose some weight, and this effort would pay off. In the Survival Tactics video that was filmed in the fall of 2011, you could see Steez looks significantly lighter as he was actually known for being a fly but bigger kid around school, being around 200 pounds, but he would lose a significant amount of weight, looking like a completely different person, with his old friends even saying according to that Fader article, yo you look like a rapper now with him even getting dreads too. One of the first interviews that Joey and Steve did was on the NYU Student Radio Podcast. This one was about an hour long and dropped around March of 2012, maybe like two weeks after Survival Tactics dropped. It gives a glimpse into Joey and Steve's friendship as they bounce ideas, concepts, and express their opinions on various topics in hip hop with a lot of passion. They go on to speak on topics like spirituality, their approach to songwriting, how they got into rapping, ambitions for Pro Era, thoughts on the double XL list, and a lot of other things too. This is a great listen for those who want to see how Joey was in the very beginning of his career, as well as those who want to learn more about Steez, especially since he only had a handful of in-depth interviews while he was still alive. But Joey gives off more of a laid back and humorous demeanor while Steez gives off a more passionate and low key opinionated vibe when it comes to his views on hip hop at the time. It's important to note that Steez and Joey grew into very good friends, which only added to their great chemistry together as rappers, helping to make survival tactics such a standout track. But they got into rapping very differently. Joey would go on to say on this podcast, quote, You know, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, Flatbush. I lived in, um, well, I didn't live in Best Style, but like every summer, like, you know, I would spend in bed style because like my grandmother and like all my other cousins would go over there so like I, I was um since I was a baby like you know I've just been reciting Biggie lyrics mm. like I like the first song I knew was Hypnotized like I knew the whole song at like two years old oh wow but, yeah just like so, like I, I, I really like Biggie since like you know since birth mm -hmm. and ever since then like I just really fell in love with hip-hop as a child and I just would like, you know, when poetry was introduced to me in school, it was just like, oh, this is like what they do on the radio. This is yeah. what I'm hearing. So, like, that's what I would just start doing. And, like, my, teacher will, my teachers will always notice, like, how I switched up with the rap flow and things like that. And they will always say, like, you know, you, you're a smart kid. You're going to be something one day. While it came pretty naturally for both Steez and Joey, Steez says in his own words that his experience was essentially the opposite of Joey's, as rapping was his way of expression. However, he wasn't encouraged to rap as he says, quote, I feel like the thing is with me, it was very, very opposite. Like, the reason why I became a rapper, it was more like, it was squeezed out of me because, like, the public school system, I was put in a, a school with, like, basically none of my, my peers, you know? Like, I was the only black kid, per se. Mm. And, like, a lot, a lot of the kids, you know, I grew up smart, you know, I always had intelligence. But I'm like, yo, this school stuff is, is whack, you know? You, you don't get to have any diversity. You don't get to be you. You got to be what the system wants. Mm. And, like, <laughs> America's going to hate me for this. But, like, yeah. I grew up always thinking, like, I want to be different. And I felt like, you know, music, 
it, it wasn't something hard to me because my father was a musician, my sister was a musician. Like, talent, it, it's in my family. And I just, like, the thing is, my mom didn't support my music, so I always mm. felt like me doing music was the wrong thing. Mm. And that's, what, that's why, like, a lot of my lyrics are very passionate because I felt like that's my only way of voicing myself and I'm not allowed to do it. Mm. So me choosing music is like me saying, don't listen to, to, to everybody and think that's the right decision. You know, you soak it all in and make your that's the decision based on that. Don't like, don't let anybody choose your path for you in life except God. Definitely, definitely. Yourself. Overall, this was a deeply insightful interview that I see gets some unnecessary flag from some fans, specifically when the interviewer doesn't ask more questions about Steve's spirituality. But I want fans to keep in mind that at this time, Steve was a buzzing local artist who was just starting to get his work out there on a bigger stage and not the figure that we know of today. Following the release of Survival Tactics, Pro Era would start doing interviews and dropping more consistently, really capitalizing off of the initial hype that the track brought them. One that stands out is the interview and mini documentary Noisy did on Joey Badass and Pro Era. It shows them in school, teachers reacting to the Survival Tactics video, and they go into the origins of the crew at a time that was very early into their career. I say Joey and Pro Era because the video includes Pro Era, but for the most part it focuses on Joey, with him doing most of the speaking. Capital Steez being one of the founders of Pro Era, he goes into his goals for the crew and how that aligns with his own personal goals too. Shortly after these stringent interviews, Capital Steez would drop his first and only official solo project called American Corruption. It dropped on April 7th, 2012, on 4-7 actually, and has been referred to as AK-47 by some. The cover showcases the controversial 47 sticker prominently, while having the infamous red and white color scheme as well. This project functions as a mixtape in its truest form, with Steve's rapping over mostly beats that others have rapped over first. Rapping over beats by Madlib, MF Doom, and from Atmosphere, and DJ Premier among many others, with a handful of original produced songs in the mix by PE producers Bruce Lee Kicks, Kirk Knight, and even Joey Badass. The songs really don't flow together like albums do, however, these songs show Steez's skills as an MC in full display, with him having some topical tracks, songs where other pro era members featured, and songs where he absolutely destroys and shows off his lyrical prowess on the mic. When describing the concept for American Corruption and its origins, Steez explains that But like, I was going through changes in myself that I realized, you know, like I went through a major weight loss and I realized that only reason why I was I was that 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 product was I'm a product of my environment, you know? Mm -hmm. And I see things on television like, you know, a lot of junk food, a lot of mm. technology. It's just like I'm absorbing all this stuff. I wanna be that, you know? And I'm not knowing that I'm growing up in the wrong footsteps. So like I just took time after high school to find myself. And like what's left is me, I wanna make it in America without falling into America, Americans corruption. Mm. Also, on the second appearance on the New York University's student radio, he further explains. Basically, it was a, 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 a time in my life where I just, I thought I was going crazy, you know? And like, I realized that I wasn't the one that was crazy. I realized that it's the system that was built against me, you know? And like, I'm not supposed to be talking about this. And that's the corruption of it because like, me just seeing it is absurd. And I want people to open up their eyes and realize that I'm not wrong, you know? I'm, I'm just an open-minded individual and people should be more open-minded. Mm -hmm. That's all. This gives a lot of insight as to what the thought process was behind these songs and lyrics that we know today. I could rave on and on about this tape as it's one of my personal favorites of all time. But in my opinion, this tape just has back-to-back -back bangers filled with one-liners, layered lyrics with multiple meanings, punchlines, metaphors, and all the characteristics that make a rapper truly great. He raps with a great amount of personality, charisma, and skill on the mic, which is just astonishing if I'm being completely honest. I mean, just look at this video that highlights the rhyme schemes in the song Doggy Bang. Like, this is just ridiculous. Keep in mind his age. Steez was only 18 at the time that this tape dropped, which makes him a rap prodigy in my eyes. Standout tracks include Dead Prez, which many see as a pseudo suicide note in many ways. Free the Robots is another highlight, which is a song that Steez dedicates to his spiritual beliefs and the corruption that he saw clear as day in the world growing up in the city as a black man, perpetuated by the government that we're supposed to trust. This song also has themes of a coming apocalypse that he sees and having to worry about people doing each other dirty as well. 
But aside from the lyrics, what really stands out is his passion and delivery on this song. You could hear just how much he cares about these topics on Free the Robots. But other standouts include the love song 135, Cat Fair with CJ Fly and Chuck Strangers, which is an absolute banger, 47 Elements, Doggy Bag, Chicago, and the heartfelt Infinity and Beyond. This song is dedicated to David Wright Robinson, who was a classmate with Steve's and Tom and Dozen and the Phony People, but he tragically passed away at the age of 18 in 2010, with Steve's actually annotating some of the bars of this song himself on Genius. The first verse has been around for a while though, as there's a video of Steve's rapping the verse with maybe his sister and his niece. I can't really confirm, but it's a really wholesome video. Now there's so many crazy one-liners, metaphors, crazy bars, and punchlines littered on this tape that going over all of them would literally be its own video. A few that stand out are when he says, I keep a low key A flat, which gave me the ill stank face when I first heard it. Another one is when he says on 47 elements, let me introduce you to the elements, A U, I heard you shining, but I got that gold membership, which as described on Genius, is a way of Steve's describing that you might be cool, but since Steve's is gold, he shines brighter. And when he says A U, it isn't just a way for Steve to get your attention. It's actually a play on words as A U is the scientific symbol for gold which refers to the central theme of the song being 47 elements. Just these examples alone show you that Steez was on another level when it came to crafting Laren bars. So overall American Corruption is a really solid tape that shows Steez's talent and you can see that he was really coming into his own as a rapper. Having some songs that are more focused on showing this skill in all of its glory and other songs that are more topical with punchlines still being present but taking more of a backseat. Lastly I would like to note that Steez only dropped one video during this time period, which was the more raw and amateur style vibe ratings, which I personally still love, but while juxtaposed with Joey's video for survival tactics and the videos that would eventually come out for Waves and From the Tombs, there was a sharp difference. But regardless, AK-47 was a great tape that unfortunately flew under the radar of most of the hip hop world. <laughs> Sticking with striking while the iron is hot. Two months following the release of Steez's mixtape, American Corruption, it was Joey's turn to drop. And on June 12, 2012, Joey Badass would drop his debut mixtape, 1999. Now unlike American Corruption, which functioned as a mixtape in its truest form, 1999 would be sequenced and flow more like an album. With even Joey Badass saying this in his retrospective interview with Genius years later, explaining that he approached making 1999 like it was his first album. Now 1999 was a hit among fans and critics alike, with many pointing out how peculiar it was for a 17 year old up and coming to be rapping in the style and over beats that were more reminiscent of the golden era and east coast style of hip hop from the 90s. Now the beats on this mixtape were laced with jazzy samples and grooves with many of the beats on 1999 actually being from the 90s. So 1999 would feature some original production from pro era Chuck Strangers, Bruce Lee Kicks, and Static Selecta, which Joey and Static would go on to become somewhat of a dynamic duo throughout the years, but the tape mostly had beats that other rappers previously used. These beats would include production from MF Doom, Knowledge, Jay Dilla, Freddie Jotham, and Lord Finesse among others. But it's crazy to see just how similar Steve's and Joey's styles were at this time because 1999, like American Corruption, would include songs where Joey would really just showcase his lyrical abilities and other more topical songs like Funky Ho, Don't Front with CJ Fly, and Penny Royal that were all about love. Songs like Righteous Minds and Hard Knock, which are two of my favorite tracks on this tape, would focus on how hard it is coming up in Brooklyn, specifically in a crime-ridden neighborhood. There were even more aspirational songs like Waves, Daily Routine, and Snakes, where Joey would rap about his hunger and ambitions for being in the rap game. This tape would highlight the great chemistry between Capital Steve's and Joey Badass with legendary songs like Survival Tactics, and Kaluminati, where they both just killed their verses while showcasing their top-notch lyrical ability. I'd like to reiterate that it was just impressive to see a kid as young as Joey spinning at such a high level with smooth flows, multiple syllable rhyme schemes, double entendres, and very layered bars. Joey rapped with nonchalance and in such a laid-back way that it was just infectious. I could go on and on about the greatness of 1999, and also I'd like to add that Joey and CJ Fly were another great duo on this tape too. If I was to pick, my personal standouts would be Kaluminati, Snakes, Righteous Minds, Don't Front, Funky Ho, and From the Tombs. It's hard to not just list the whole track list if I'm being completely honest here. Also the posse cut, Third Eye Shit, aka Suspect would showcase Pro Era as a whole 
as they would all come through with solid verses. I think this may have been the first full posse cut with the pros, but the standout verses in my opinion came from Steez, Joey of course, Diamond Lewis, and Desi Hines. When describing the overall concept in 1999 in the first NYU student podcast with Steez, Joey would say, what it is is that, like, you know how they refer to the 90s as, like, the golden age of hip-hop? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, 1999 being the last year of the golden age, it's sort of like a last hope type of thing. Mm -hmm. like, you know, like, everything is just falling into place, because I had this concept since way, the, like, the concept since way back. And before I even brought it up, like, you know, I just dropped the Survivor Tactics video, and off of that, people was already, like, already feeding off of the concept, like, yo, the golden age is about to return, so it's just like, mm -hmm. wow, the synchronization is just, yeah. That's crazy. crazy. This tape would garner acclaim, especially from critics. And 10 plus years later, this tape is seen as a classic from hip hop's blog era. 1999 will get reviews from publications like Pitchfork, which gave it an 8 out of 10, Spin giving it a 6 out of 10, All Hip Hop giving it an 8.5 out of 10, and Hip Hop DX giving it a 4 out of 5 stars. 1999 would also get reviewed from YouTuber Anthony Fantano and YouTube legends at Dan and Hip Hop would review it and also know how the tape was great, but where does Joey go from here? Is he, as well as Pro Era, just gonna be known as the 90s style rappers? Joey Badass will feel this later on in his career as he felt boxed in and some fans will give him flag for expanding his sound beyond the boom bap and lyrical aesthetic. But overall, this tape is a classic and one of the best from the blog era. It put Joey Badass and Pro Era on the map and it would seem like things would only go up from here with the videos for Waves and From the Tombs dropping that summer getting millions of views. Overall, I would say that 1999 aged really well. While being a mixtape, it flowed more like an album, and it had a mixture of some serious topical songs, love songs, and songs that just showed what Joey Badass, Capital Steez, and a large number of the other pro era members had to offer the rap game. It was an anomaly to see rappers this young rapping over beats from a time long gone and at such a high level of quality. There's a reason why 1999 is known as a classic from the blog era, and as the year 2012 would continue, pro era would be consistent with their music. However, as the year progressed, there would be a noticeable change in Steez's personal spiritual beliefs, and this would be reflected in his music and online presence. Shortly after the release of American Corruption, Capital Steves would go on the NYU student radio show for the second time, but this time he would go alone without any of the other pro era members, including Joey Badass. This interview is really the only in-depth look into Steves as a rapper and as a person that's out there. So shout out to the interviewer for deciding to bring Steves on for the second time. Aside from discussing topics like how American Corruption came to be, his process into picking beats, and actually wanted to make beats himself, Steves would also go in depth discussing his spiritual beliefs and how it influenced his music too. Very importantly too, Steves let it slip how he felt slept on and how things weren't happening for him like they were happening for Joey. I decided to discuss this now as earlier I showed the contrast between the release of 1999 and American Corruption. Let me also put out the disclaimer out there that I love Joey's music and I don't place any blame on Joey when it comes to Steez's tragic death. However, to fully discuss Steez's story, I have to get into his feelings about seeing Cinematic put more time and money into Joey Badass but not himself and the rest of Pro Era. But in response to the interview saying that they really blew up at the survival tactics dropped, Steez responded with, I mean in terms of videos like the Sur survival tactics and your whole crew really like launched out of the, that one video in the sense that survival that video tactics. really blew up i don't know man i feel like it did but i still get slept on you know yeah. i don't get hit up for interviews as much as i would like to mm -hmm. i just wait patiently i mean really my biggest issue like forgive me but like joey he gets free clothes i, I wish i got free clothes <laughs> i wish i got free clothes too. <laughs> No, that's all I'm saying. Like, Steve has a few more remarks like this in the interview. Like when the interviewer asks him about the reception of American Corruption, he says, "I'm trying to find reception." And when the interviewer follows up by asking if he feels slept on, Steve responds by saying, "Quote: How do you feel the reception for the project has been?" I mean, I'm trying to find some reception. Hmm. So you feel like it's been slept on? Oh, definitely. I mean, that's because I'm very impatient. I heard it. I heard it has like 13. K views or more, but I don't know how much exact downloads it has. Mm. I don't really follow it too much. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm not on TV yet. <laughs> yeah. And lastly, when asked about any offers from labels, Steve would say bluntly, Offers from labels? I'm trying to get a buzz. Like, and after this, they go back and forth as the interviewer asks, quote, Oh, so you feel like, the, so there's like no, do you feel like all the attention's on Joey? I can't say that. Yeah. 
<laughs> you basically just did though. Oh yeah, it is though, but like it's not it's not hate though. It's like No, it's not hate. I mean I the attention is on Joey. Because like I always wanted to be looked at as like that dude that's always wandering off in the corner. But this the, the energy is still there, you know? Like the mystery behind me, I'm putting it upon myself. Mm -hmm. Because there's gonna be a lot of questions that need to be answered. Which is kind of where the whole thing about Joey Badass being the face of Pro Era while Steve's being the teacher came from. But I want to say that I don't think there was any beef. I just think that Steve's noticed the differences between how the label was treating them and honestly didn't like feeling slept on at all. Maybe there was tension there, but I really don't want to speculate on that as we really don't know from the outside looking in. This was also when Steve started to see how the industry works and according to the Fader article, the head of cinematic music group Johnny Shikes would go on to say, quote, I don't think everybody is meant to do business together and that just wasn't something that fit. The article would also perfectly point out the contrast between Joey and Steve saying quote Joey was an easier artist to promote an energetic MC with plenty of skill and an ineffable cool in contrast to Steve whose scruffy image and strong viewpoints didn't lend themselves easy to the superficial whims of the blogosphere which could possibly explain why countless of resources were spent making Joey Bass a star of the blog era while Steve's only had one amateur music video out at the time, and Joey would have videos out for four different songs and at a noticeably better quality. Apparently, Jesse Rubin, who used to work at Cinematic, said in that article, quote, Steve's could have been commercial if he sacrificed a few things, which he wasn't willing to do, which really showed how Cinematic Music Group's thought process was when it came to their artists. They were really looking for mass appeal. This all really makes a lot of sense, as it was Joey who the label discovered and Joey who they wanted to sign, but they only signed the rest of pro era because Joey Badass wouldn't budge, which I commend him for to be honest. Aside from speaking on these topics, Steve would also mention a collab project with him and Chuck Strangers that was supposed to release on his birthday of that year, 7-7-2012, called 77 Strangers. But for unknown reasons, this tape would never come out. I'm unsure why it didn't come out as songs like The Lounge with them and Uno Hype, which is one of my favorites by Steve's, and Nine More Burgers with them and Rockin' Mouth would emerge after Steve's death. It's unclear whether or not these songs were supposed to be on the tape, but it's a possibility that these tracks were intended for 77 Strangers and that there is another Lost Capital C's project out there. But seeing as King Capital has yet to come out, we might never know. But this one and only in-depth interview gave us deep insight to Steve's mind state at this time and his feelings on several things, especially the industry. As the year 2012 would progress, things would continue to build for Pro Era. They would continue to do interviews and have legendary ciphers throughout that summer. One of my favorites being the one that they did with Pitchfork, where they all had a cipher in an interview on a rooftop, and Steve's would spit one of his best verses. Joey Badass would put out two more videos that year for Waves and From the Tombs, keeping their momentum going. Pro Era even opened up for Mac Miller in August of that year for the New York date of the Macadelic tour. Steve's would also experience a lot of firsts in the summer of 2012. Pro Era would go on the Smokers Club tour with Juicy J and Smoke Dizza. Steve's would try Shrooms, which for many people is a deeply spiritual experience. As Shrooms are known for having a self-reflective nature, and according to friends of his, he would also lose his virginity while on tour too. Shout out to those groupies, man. But notably, for that tour and on multiple interviews, they would be billed as Joey Badass and Parra, which is something to note. As the Fader article put it, Steve's was being pushed to the back of his own group. Also, according to friends, Steve's wasn't very fond of life on the road and touring, as he got little sleep and mostly would have to eat junk food. Now, I personally haven't toured yet, but I have many friends in the hardcore scene who have been on multiple tours, and I can say that touring is not for the weak. Playing shows itself is an incredible experience, but life on the road can be very taxing, and people who go on tour are usually very relieved to be back home. Also, Joey Badass's mother and Johnny Shipes would officially work out a deal and Pro Era would get registered as an LLC owned by Joey and his mother, which made the working relationship between Pro Era and Cinematic Music Group official. But all of these experiences would start to weigh on Steve's and soon, people around him started to see a change in him that was hard for many to pinpoint and understand. According to most, this was around the time that Steve's began to change. He started to become disillusioned with the music industry. Jack the Rhymer, Steve's best friend, would call him whenever he got the chance while Steve's was on tour. And he would go on to say, quote, He started getting darker almost after that. It went to a different place when speaking on his spirituality. Jack's intuition as one of his best friends was correct 
as these began to identify with the Baphomet. Now the Baphomet is a deity that has its origins that go all the way back to the medieval times. It is highly disputed by historians, but it's alleged that the Knights Templar of the Catholic Church worshipped the Baphomet. They were accused of this by the French king at the time, Philip IV. However, the Baphomet would later end up being incorporated into various occult and western esoteric traditions. The Baphomet itself is characterized as a half goat, half human being with both male and female body parts, the head of a beast, body of a human, and wings. One arm is pointed upwards towards a bright moon, while the other arm is pointed downward towards a dark moon. The arm pointed upwards has the word solve on it, while the other arm has the word coagula on it. Even though the Baphomet's presence in many occult traditions makes it associated with the darker aspects of certain religions, it is seen as not benevolent or wicked. Now, Steve's himself very much identified with the Baphomet, being seen in pictures wearing different shirts with the Baphomet on it, and even going as far as getting Saul tattooed on one of his forearms. I can't find the exact text or screenshots as Steve's Facebook has been taken down since his death, but it is alleged that Steve would change his profile picture multiple times to the Baphomet, which lit up his updated profile picture with comments from friends, people leaving comments like, what type of shit are you on, among other things. Now the Fader article and others have pointed to this being a turning point in Steve's spiritual journey, even calling it bizarre as his identification with the Baphomet and other aspects of New Ageism like dimensional shifts and alchemy was a noticeable change, as earlier in the year, his focus was on things like meditation, the chakra system, and frequencies. Even though there is no doubt that his sense of spirituality started taking a darker turn as the year 2012 went on, there could be a simple explanation as to why Steve's identified with the Baphomet so much, that being how it represents balance and duality. The meaning behind the Baphomet and its imagery is that it's supposed to quote, symbolize the equilibrium of opposites specifically representing the goal of perfect social order. Since the Batman represents balance and Steve's concept for 47 is a perfect representation of balance in his eyes, then it makes sense why Steve would look into the Batman. However, it is important to note that Steve took this further, as he didn't just look into its symbolism and meaning, he truly identified with the Batman, as he would allegedly comment on that same Facebook post, quote, what if I am the Batman? Years later on Reddit, fans would discuss Steez's song tattoo and what the Batman could have really meant to Steez. User Michael8367 would break down how some people interpret this deity as well as breaking down the meaning behind solving coagula by explaining quote, Solving coagula means to dissolve and coagulate in Latin, to break down a substance down to its basic elements before reforming it into something new. This could be analogous to the destruction of one's ego before the realization of the true self, or the distillation of a substance down to the prima materia to make alchemical preparations in its purified state of principles of alchemy. This user also goes on to explain that it also has a philosophical meaning referring to self-reflection, breaking down your psyche to make yourself new, so it's evident that there's a spectrum of interpretations to the Batman, but its association with the occult makes it a controversial figure. However, it's shown to have meanings that closely align with the esoteric spirituality that Steve's embodied while he was still here. I can't find where this is from, but the user also claims that when talking about this deity, Steve said, The Batman was the god of alchemy, spiritual enlightenment, and kundalini energy. The spirit is that Jah is the same spirit that created the light. That is why Lucifer is referred to a serpent or a light bearer. Whichever way you put it, the Batman came in peace. So while some may say that Steve's spiritual journey took a bizarre turn around this time and that there's some evidence to back this up, it is possible that Steve did not see the Batman as his dark figure. Instead, he may have seen it as a representation of balance which resonated with him as he had 47 as his own concept of balance in the world. And like the controversial 47 sticker, he may have seen this as an opportunity to bring people in with shocking imagery. It's sad that we'll never truly know though. According to the Fader article when speaking about Steve's and his mental state, Jack the Rhymer would say, quote, you would talk to Steve's and not know what he's talking about. He would say something and you'd just be like, what are you talking about? That's my best friend, my brother, and I love him. At the same time, he was a little off and had some demons he was dealing with. We all do. Certain videos from this time period, you could see Steve's begin to withdraw 
and have a noticeable change in his demeanor. When in the past he was always smiling and full of life, you could almost see him thinking to himself and overall just being more apart. One video that stands out is a freestyle where all the pros would take turns rapping over classic beats. And at a certain point when Steez gets cut off, his face would just say it all. But as the session would continue and the DJ would play the 93 to infinity beat, Joey and the rest of the pros would encourage him to spit his infinity and beyond verse. Which in my eyes, and the eyes of many fans, show that the love between them never diminished in spite of whatever turmoil Steez may have been going through at the time. This overall darker outlook, mixed with Steez increasingly becoming more disillusioned with the industry, would eventually prove tragic, as this would greatly impact Steez's mental well-being as the year would go on. Steez always had great ambitions for Pro Era, as he would often talk about taking over the world through their music and world domination. Even in Pro Era's earliest interviews, he would speak on this, but Steez's mindset began to grow more grandiose as he would start talking about serving Ja and a greater purpose. Even allegedly writing on July 12th of that year, quote, in 2012, they predicted an alchemist would rise with the key to world peace. I think it's me. Man, it sucks that they took down his Twitter in 2017 after it got hacked because it would have been really insightful to see exactly what Steve was tweeting around this time too. That could have gave us a clearer picture of what was really going on. But also, in an interview years later with Montreality reflecting on Capital Steez, Issa Gold from the Underachievers would say how Steez influenced him to start thinking outside the box again, with him saying, quote, Yeah, yeah. it's like I spent years thinking irrationally when I was like probably 14 to 17, like growing up, like having real out there thoughts. And um, when I was around 17 is when I really started to buckle down and try and find like a rational scientific approach to like spirituality. And from doing that, I started to lose, uh, in a, I started to lose like the ability to like um, really think freely. I started to really think in a box because I don't want anything to seem crazy. And what Steve was able to bring back for me was, yeah, thinking out of the box again. Like, cause he really wanted to do some crazy shit that just was like, eh, that's a little crazy, but you know, <laughs> we can do this maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, he made me, he, he brought back abstract thinking for me, which was the original way of thinking, but. Which shows how even though in a lot of ways Steve's mentality was admirable, it's undeniable that around this time, Steve would say things and have ideas that were just perplexing to others to say the least. But other things were going on around this time that may have had an impact on him as well. Now I think it would be the best time to address if there was tension between Joey Badass and Capital Steez. Now it's unclear if there was actually tension between them, as it's never been fully confirmed by insiders. But for years now, there's been speculation that this may have been one of the reasons why Steez took his own life. So let's explore it. Now the statement Steez made on his second appearance on the NYU student podcast about things like Joey Badass getting free clothes, the lack of reception for American corruption, and him feeling slept on has been and part of the reason why fans believe that there was tension between the two rappers, with other things being pointed out. For example, the fact that Steez was getting pushed to the sidelines of a group he started, as Pro Era were frequently marketed as Joey Badass and Pro Era on merch, in interviews, and on tour. It's safe to say that Steez did feel slighted by this in a way, as fans have pointed out, especially on Reddit, with one user saying that, quote, he definitely felt unappreciated, seeing as Joey, who was pretty much his protege, getting all the attention from the interview industry and that they, Cinematic Music Group, outright said they weren't interested in Steez, just Joey. And another user would reply by pointing out that, quote, as an adult I recognized that there was easily enough space for Joey and Steez to coexist in the rap world and both floors, but I can also see how at the time and at his age he might have thought that Joey was getting what was meant for him and it was a struggle for him. These two comments were very insightful and could have very well have played a part with what was going on with Steez mentally as there were other things going on with him as mentioned before, like his spirituality taking a dark and bizarre turn. But I'd like to point out that I've also found a song that someone leaked that showed Steve's venting his frustration at the rap game and seemingly throwing shots at Joey with the line, Joey's saying that we gonna be living comfortable. Explain why I'm stuck up in this cluttered room, claustrophobic, one step closest to my fucking tomb. Which just blew me away when I first heard it, as it shows Steve's voicing his anger and being pushed to the side when it seems like Joy was the only one getting the shine. I should mention that things could have changed with the release of Peep and other projects, but it seems like these feelings Steve's had and other things in his mind would unfortunately not get better. Another interesting piece of evidence is a text conversation between Steve's 
and one of the members of the Arch Producers who frequently collab with Steve's and Pro Era. Now this conversation goes all the way back to October of 2012 and in this Steve would say some alarming things and give more insight as to what was going on behind the scenes. For those who are listening to the video, I'll go over what they were saying to each other in the conversation. From what is shown, it starts with Steve telling the producer, quote, Dude, I'm not even that passionate for writing music. I just do it for Beast Coast, 547 shit. And he replies back by saying, Crazy cuz it seems natural, but okay, good luck. Steve then goes on to tell him, It is, I'm an airbender. If you haven't noticed, I get outshined in pro era. I just sit back. The producer tells him, quote, not even. Then Steve replies by saying, fuck this shit. I'm about to get my money and make my own Steve's. The producer tells Steez that he's his favorite rapper in pro era and Steez replies with gratitude telling him thanks cuz I can tell that's why I respect your beats and then Steez shockingly tells him that I'm never in the stew cuz I gotta go through Joey. Then the producer tells Steez that no one wants to give you the shine and if Steez wants to make music that he would even fly to New York and do a project with Steez but he wasn't convinced with Steez simply telling him it's a bit too late for that. Now I think that Steez was having a hard time adjusting to being on a label because when you're on a label you can't record or release freely as you would if you were self-releasing music. I also want to add that while I've been editing this video, I actually found a few telling posts from the Capital Steez subreddit. One post I found was from Steez's Tumblr, where fans could ask him questions directly. Someone says that he should make a video for the songs 135 and Cat Fair, and Steez simply answers by saying that they both got scrapped. Also, there is a video for Up Above that's out there somewhere, but it never got released. This is surreal as the video for 135 eventually came out posthumously, but these videos getting scrapped behind the scenes also could have added to the Steve's feeling resentful and disillusioned with the industry. I remember even little Uzi Vert was frustrated about this and he used to talk about something similar around 2017 or 2018 maybe. You could tell Steve was resentful with the way things were going and even thought about starting his own thing. Maybe these were things that Steve was contemplating for a while, but with a lot of the things in the story, we'll never really know for sure. But these few things give us a deeper insight on how Steve felt about his change of position in pro era. And I don't want to put this on Joey as losing your best friend is a lot to carry, let alone being blamed for that. I just simply want to show how Steve felt about being put to the side of pro era and how that could have possibly affected him. Although Steve's had a team of like-minded artists around him with pro era and fellow Beast Coast members flapping zombies and the underachievers, Steez was still painfully insecure with being slept on as a solo rapper, receiving much buzz of recognition as we discussed before. In September of 2012, Steez would release the video for his song, Free the Robots, with the visual, in my opinion, fully representing the message behind the song. As in the beginning, it shows Steez essentially being brainwashed by the television that he's watching, and aside from Steez rapping, it's showing a collage of all the horrors that make up the world like war, disease, famine, corrupt politicians, among other things too, with Steez eventually coming to his senses, shutting off the TV, going outside, and embracing the essence. The next month, on October 10th, 2012, Steve would release a reloaded version of American Corruption, kind of like the modern day deluxe edition of an album, but it would be a re-release of American Corruption, with essentially an EP's worth of new music added on top of the mixtape. The reloaded version would feature seven new songs with production from pro era producers like Kirk Knight and even Joey Badass. Also, it would feature beats from legendary producer Knowledge and frequent collaborators, the entrepreneurs. It would feature songs where Steve would show off his sharp lyrical abilities, like on Apex and Up Above, featuring Dirty Sanchez. Apex especially showed how creative and layered Steve's bars could get at times, as well as his effortless charisma on the mic, with dizzying lines like, The prodigy of an alchemist is in the goals and rotation, bringing amethyst. Must be out to cranium to even try to aim at this. Get it? Amethyst? Aim at this? Like, my god, he was just operating on a whole other level with crafting these bars. There's also layers of this bar that include references to Steve's ability to turn his bars into gold by comparing himself to an alchemist, while this bar is also a reference to Legends, Prodigy, and the alchemists who frequently collaborated with each other. If I was to break down every single one of Steve's bars, I'd be here all day. But this just goes to show how insane his skills were at crafting lyrics with multiple meanings, tight flows, and making it all sound cohesive. There were also songs like Evil Love and Black Petunia where Steve would dive deep into his mental health 
and what he could have possibly been going through with depression. Two of his most vulnerable songs, I might add, but both songs really resonated with me as a teenager because it was a time in my life that was honestly really confusing. And I could relate to a lot of what Steez was talking about in both of these tracks. Evil Love is a song that stays on the topic of Steez's ambitions and overall feeling of bitterness he has and his experiences impacting his mental state with a chorus that says, quote, The evil of love is so subliminal and the love of evil is so sinister This damnation is ran by sinister Mill finger to your past and your minister It's essentially him saying that the politicians who portray themselves to be holier than thou are just as bad as us and hide their negative attributes as well as the contradiction that is love that the people who love you the most are also the people who can hurt you the most at the same time hence the evil of love being subliminal also he would rap about masking his pain and no one in his life really seeing the suffering he was going through behind closed doors but the second verse being filled with bars of steve's reflecting on this including lines like the smile ain't the same no more I looked up and the sky ain't the same no more I looked up what the meaning of life was It ended up with a fake smile and a light buzz Right cuz, it went off like a light bulb I might seem fine but this smile's only blasted on Which essentially talks about faking it in front of your loved ones And coping with depression through self-medication But if you've ever experienced depression or know people who have you'll know that this is a sad reality that people with depression face. His smile would be referenced multiple times with Steve's also rapping, quote, I might seem fine, but the smile's only plastered on. Now this is a song I've been listening to for years and especially when I'm going through some rough times. But noticing how Steve talks about faking a smile multiple times really got to me because he is known by his friends, family, and his fans as being a person who would always smile, especially when rapping. Other standout lines from this song include when he says, I'm emotionally damaged, a lonely little bastard still growing as a man with intentions of only common intentions. Which refers to the struggle that is growing up without one parent, specifically without a father, which is a reality that many, including myself, can relate to all too well. And despite his big ambitions, he only has common intentions, like making music, or the way I interpret these bars, finding love. Even the way Steve performs this song is unlike any other song I heard from his, with him sounding bitter and angry with a distinct more aggressive delivery. The song Black Petunia is another song that explores Steve's mental health and one that Steve reflects on his experiences with women, the way he views himself, the pressure he feels to be successful, and to provide for his family as he's the only man in the household. Jack the Rhymer, his third kind partner, is also featured on this track and his verse stays with the theme that Steve raps about and he even calls this song, quote, the requiem from the hard times. As both Steve and Jack discuss the hard times they both face and feel as Jack raps about the death of his father, which just is different as my own father passed away in the spring of 2023. So the grief that Jack raps about is something that hits really close to home for me. But both Steve and Jack would rap about what they were going through with great skill, passion, and personality. With Steve's rap being standout lines like, I'm trapped in my reality when I look in the mirror, there's a bastard staring back at me. The last chance of happiness for my family, cause mama's getting older and it's bringing up the man in me. Another time where Steve refers to not having a father in his life, which may show how much this must have affected him. This is also the second reference to Steve's calling himself a bastard, which in retrospect is really sad. He would go on to rap, I think I'm losing it, homies asking what happened to you, which also in retrospect is a bar that deeply saddens me as both Jack in the Fader article and later Joey Badass with the therapist on Vice would speak on how Steve's apparently would say things that no one could really understand, which is scary to witness as a friend, but imagine being the person speaking. This might give insight into Steve's actually being aware of what was going on, but not knowing how to fix it. None of that is really confirmed, and honestly, I'm just thinking out loud right now. Overall, some of Steve's best songs are on AK Reloaded, with the songs featured being in the same caliber as the original release of American Corruption. Some songs being topical, focusing on love, Steve's mental health, and depression while other songs focus on spirituality and Steve's flexing his lyrical abilities and all of his greatness. Songs like Black Petunia and Evil Love would possibly give us a glimpse into Steve's mental state and how he truly saw himself. Now American Corruption Reloaded would sadly be the last batch of officially released Capital Steve's music we would get as the highly anticipated King Capital has yet to be released and truthfully has no sign of coming out anytime soon. According to the Fader article, Steve's releasing a reloaded version of American Corruption was an attempt to generate more buzz, but aside from fans of the Beast Coast movement, it really didn't make the waves that Steve's intended. In 
several songs and in interviews, Steve would mention a shift that would take place. He would often be very big in explaining exactly what this was though, but he would describe a great change that would take place in the world. Aside from the shift, he would also often speak about Doomsday in his songs as well with Free the Robots being littered with references of this. Since Steve was deep into the world of spirituality and his practices, it actually makes sense. If you were there, then you would remember the theory that the world would end in 2012, specifically December 21st, 2012. This was due to the fact that the Maya calendar ended on this date, and while some people, including my 13-year-old self, would make jokes about it, many practitioners of New Ageism would take this prediction seriously, and it seems Steve did as well. Of course, the Fader article I mentioned several times would explore what this was, and even talk to a few of Steve's friends about the shift that he would often speak about. Now, Linda Hansen, one of Steve's friends who lived in Los Angeles at the time, would explain that quote, it had to do with how it's all gonna change, how we're gonna have to be at peace with our spirits and see what is wrong and what is right. Also, in November 2012, a few days after Hurricane Sandy hit New York, Steve would meet up with Jared Harari, one of his friends from elementary school, and as they walked to the bus stop and said their goodbyes, Steve said something that would make his friend stop and think. Apparently, Steve said, if the world doesn't end, something really big is gonna happen and it's gonna change our lives. Which shows just how deeply Steve thought about this coming shift and possibly the end of the world. Apparently, he would also make these sorts of references on his Facebook as well, but I have no way of confirming this as his Facebook was seemingly taken down too. Skipping forward a little later, Steve would play his last show on December 12th, 2012 at the Public Assembly in Brooklyn, New York, with videos of Steve's performance with songs like Evil Love, Dead Prez, Apex, and at the time the unreleased King Stila would surface online. These videos are still on YouTube, with his last words in one video being, I'm on some Eagle Dead shit. But notably, an unreleased song that Steve would perform would gain a lot of notoriety after his death, with the live performance of this song getting over 350,000 views. Before starting the song, Steve said he didn't even record it yet, and if he never got around to recording it, that would just be tragic. But the song would sample Mad Villainy's Great Day beat, as Mad Lib actually replayed the Stevie Wonder sample that was originally performed on a harmonica instead on keyboards, but this beat would feature the melody being played on both instruments, if that makes sense. The song has been called Today or Can Explain by many fans or simply just Public Assembly. I think this might be the song where Steve explores his spirituality in depth the most as that's the song's primary focus. He talks about things like his third eye opening, the chakra system, and finding himself. The chorus is notable as he says, quote, <laughs> While rapping this more melodically, the annotation on Genius says, quote, Many cite American corruption being slept on as one of the reasons he took his own life, and since this was days before his death, he must have felt a moment of happiness. Which very well can be the case, but in my personal opinion, since Steve was diving deep about his spiritual beliefs in this song, I think Steve may have been describing the feeling he felt when finding himself spiritually. Other standout lines include when he says, quote, Fuck for Robbie's a party of parties, I wanna change the world, I'm awfully sorry, that can even be the next for a party, but the coffee of a heart is gone really resonated with me and showed the potential Steve once saw in himself. The last line of the song, however, reflects the feeling he felt towards the industry as he says, I still haven't found my placement because hip hop hasn't made a leap of faith, which I clearly see as Steve saying he sees greatness in himself, but the rap game doesn't see it in him. But apparently during the show, Steve was drunk, frustrated with the turnout, and even walked off stage during the performance, with him not being very happy about the said turnout, which could have very well been the case, but other videos show Steve smiling while performing too, which is moved by the brightened up later in the show. But as someone who has been in local bands, playing a show with a little turnout can be frustrating at times, so I definitely understand if Steve was feeling some type of way about this. Now the day of his last show, Steve would also get interviewed as well, which this interview might very well be one of his last. But in this interview, he's posted up outside remembers of pro era like Rocka, Desi Hines, Jab, Dirty Sanchez, and other Beast Coast members like the Arnold Jeepers too. He would briefly talk about the formation of Pro Era and Peep the Apocalypse, which was the upcoming Pro Era crew tape that would drop later that month, and he would go on to say that the tape would cause a shift in the game. 
but notably Steve's would mention King Capital in strange terms, saying how he might not have to drop after Pete, and how he has a project that he finished, but doesn't have a release date planned. We're gonna see Pro Ever, you know? They're gonna see us on some third eye shit. So what's the next project gonna be called? I mean, like, wait, we got Pete, that's gonna be solid. Like, after that, I don't even know if I'll have to drop it. You know, like, I, I, got, I got, I got this shit that I, I already finished it, but I don't know what I'm dropping it, so, like, I'm not even gonna talk about it. Dead on that, but, like, I think y'all should really listen to Peep because that's going to cause a, a whole different shift and, and we're even ready for it at this day right now, you know? I might be overanalyzing, but it seems like Steez is alluding to his death here. As we'll discuss later, he apparently told Pro I remembers what he was planning on doing, but no one could talk him out of it. Now to pivot a little bit, I'm not sure for what music video this was, but apparently during a music video shoot, Steez would say things to cinematic music group's Jesse Rubin, some things that were quote, really concerning. He would go on to say, just to look in his eyes, he was just like, I'm done with this shit. When speaking about the last week of Capital Steez's life, Dirty Sanchez, one of Steez's close friends, would tell the fader quote he didn't give a fuck about anything anymore he really didn't care before it was like every day yo let's link up after that it was like yeah i'm just gonna chill at my crib all day this is common when it comes to people dealing with depression depression can manifest itself in different ways with some people choosing to keep themselves distracted and busy while others choose to withdraw from their close friends and family essentially isolating themselves and it seems that steez was dealing with his mental troubles by withdrawing himself from those closest to him in spite of what was going on with Steez's overall mental state and his feelings towards the rap game, things were still looking up for Pro Era as they dropped several tapes, solo and crew tapes within that year. But right before 2012 would come to a close, Pro Era would drop their second mixtape called Peep the Apocalypse, with Peep standing for the Pro Era EP. But the name and the release date is an obvious play on the end of the world and the Mayan calendar as the tape dropped on December 21st, 2012, the day the world was supposed to end, which it obviously didn't as we're all here right now as we speak. But this tape would feature 17 new songs, with notably all original production this time around, with production from PE in-house producers like Chuck Strangers, Kirk Knight, and Bruce Lee Kicks, as well as production from other producers like Static Selecta, Lee Bannon, The Entre Producers, and Brandon Duche, among others. People would also have this slick album cover that featured pro era members all around the tape and even had a gif attached to it that would highlight said members with their names that was honestly so sick. But this would be the first time we really got to see all the pro era members on tracks together showcasing their skills and their chemistry with one another as they had some songs on tapes like 1999 and American Corruption but they had so many members that not all of them had their time to shine on those tapes. So this was the first time you really got to see their their crew dynamic in full effect on their own tape. In my personal opinion, Peep is truly up there with 1999 and American Corruption, as there's quality beats and verses throughout this tape that doesn't really slow down. Now many have compared this tape to 90s artists like A Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul, as a lot of the songs are very lighthearted, fun, and have a more mellow jazz rap style. But don't get it twisted, some verses can get grimy too. But while this tape did showcase other members who weren't featured prominently on other tapes, Joey Badass was featured on more than half of the songs on the tape. But I honestly credit that to his hunger at the time because he must have been writing verses like crazy to be on that many songs off peak. But Steve's would be featured on seven songs, each time having standout verses. And I'm not just saying that because I'm obviously a fan of his work. At the time, Steve's was the most experienced rapper in the crew, and many pro era members, including Joey, looked up to him. Anyways, Pete followed the same formula as the other tapes, as they had songs where members would just kill their verses with dizzying flows, punchlines, and layered wordplay, while other songs were more topical, focused on love, like on songs like Interlude 47 and Overseas. And there's even a song in that rap critics simply called F a Rap Critic. This song is notable as some critics weren't really fond of Chuck's verse on From the Tombs, trying to tell him to stick to the beats, with BZ specifically from Den and Hip Hop voicing this sentiment. So y'all should definitely check out Den and Hip Hop's review a peep. It's hilarious with them discussing this piece of lore, with Chuck saying SMD and everyone thinking that he's talking directly to BZ. Anyways, the verses that Steez did rap on this tape were all standout, but on Bun and Cheese you could hear him rapping and being able to easily adapt to a more trap style of beat. Like Water is a song that has his haunting piano sample, 
And Steez's verse in retrospect seems like a swan song with this overall vibe. His verse on Interlude 47 sticks with the theme of love, but it's interesting as his verse is essentially a double entendre, as at first glance it sounds like he's speaking about the feeling of love, but he's really describing step by step how to actually project to a partner of his, which shows just how creative Steez could get when crafting songs. Vinyls is a song where everyone kills it with some pretty long verses, but there's a video of Steve's recording his verse in one take, which is something that he was very known for doing, and as the verse comes to an end, he just ends up freestyling some lines like it's nothing. Probably my favorite song off the tape, and a verse from Steve's that gives deep insight into his state of mind during this period, is Run or Fly. Everyone kills this song with solid verses and the old school dance hall sample laced into the beat just hits different. But Steve's would skip past the punchlines and metaphors for the most part, instead bluntly speaking on the way he must have been feeling for a while. Now I don't want to say the whole verse as the whole thing is notable, but he has lines like, I woke up in the dream state. This life may seem great, but it ain't. It ain't the first time I seen gray with more high gray, purple rain for the pain. I said I hate to complain, but lately all I see is days are the same. These are bars that I simply interpret as Steve's expressing his feelings of depression and the mundane nature of life that a lot of us can relate to. The lines where Steve says he woke up in a dream state stand out to me, as Steve was possibly experimenting with astral projection and out-of-body experiences, as he frequently spoke about this. But these experiences may have had a negative impact on him. But this is only speculation though. I say this because Joey Badass in 2017 would go on to describe Capital Steve's death with the therapist on Vice, stating that he believes Steve thought he was dreaming when he passed away. We'll talk about what Joey said in this interview later in the video, but I thought it was important to note. But another key song was Kings featuring Capital Steve's and Joey Badass. This seems to be their last collaboration together, as they were definitely a dynamic duo at this time, always bringing out the best of each other. But aside from the Fire Royer sample, both of their verses on this song would stand out because of the meaning behind them. Now, according to Genius Annotations, it is heavily rumored that Joey's verse is a subtle diss towards Capital Steez, as apparently Steez had missed a pro era show. The annotations say, quote, Joey's verse is a subtle diss towards Capital Steez. After a night where Steez missed the pro era show, Joey went in the booth and vented. The annotator went on to say, quote, he was upset with Steez because he knew he had to go soon and he wasn't taking advantage of the time left on Earth, which implies that Joey may have known that Steez was planning on taking his own life and was trying to get through to him and tell him to enjoy the time that he had left. But again, these are just rumors. Listening to this song over the years, I can't help but agree with this sentiment as the verses of the song align with this rumor. The annotator claims that their sources were them talking to Beast Coast members in person about it. But the beginning of the verse may possibly be Joey making fun of the new ageism that they believe in or maybe how serious some people take it as he raps Mind, body, and soul holds the energy, but they don't know the energy. I try to keep serenity, but enemies always trying to hit me and my entity, but... And he goes on to rap, eventually we all gotta go someday, which some speculate was directed at Steve's feeling suicidal. Another standout line is when Joey says, To be this interesting, go. It may seem like we a couple, we ain't mystical, you missed the show. This line seems to directly reference the incident that's rumored to have been the catalyst for the verse. Steve's missing that pro era show as well as dispelling the thought that Paul Era seemed to fuck with the occult, as maybe Steez being into the bathroom made other people question the rest of Pro Era's beliefs. Steez even seems to respond by starting his verse by saying, like I ain't noticed we corrupted ourselves. But we may honestly never know if these rumors are true, even if they do seem to make sense. I just know that I at least had to shed light on this to tell the whole story. Lastly, the song Last Cypher was in retrospect a bittersweet number, as they originally called it Last Cypher because it was a play on Doomsday, but it would be prophetic, as this was the last posse cut featuring all the pro era members with Steezy even having the last verse on the song. Personally, I like this song a lot more than Suspect, as it's more of an upbeat song and has a fun vibe to it that feels like you're listening to them spit verses back and forth in a cypher. But overall, Peep was a great tape that had many standout verses from all the pro era members, but specifically from rappers like Nick Caution, A La Soul, CJ Fly, Joey Badass, Desi Hines, Capital Steez, and Diamond Lewis. Standout songs include Like Water, Run a Fly, The Renaissance, Resurrection of Real, Bun and Cheese, Kings, Last Cypher, and more. Listening back to this tape, I couldn't help but feel the sense of nostalgia from my high school days, 
smoking with my friends and just living life. If you were tapped into the underground or even from New York, this tape probably has a special place in your heart as many of my friends look back fondly at Peep in this era in hip hop. But even though things were looking up for pro era as a whole and the year 2012 was coming to a close, Steez's spirits still weren't lifted, with those feelings of depression and being disillusioned with the industry still being prevalent. It was showing his demeanor in the last week of his life and sadly, this would have tragic consequences. Five days before Capital Steez would tragically take his own life, he would record his last known verse. This verse would be a feature on Last Straw by fellow Brooklyn rapper Smith. Now Smith would come through with a solid verse that was all part of rappers who spit with a more traditional and underground style. Overall, I really enjoyed his verse. But Steez's verse had this captivating energy, especially in his delivery and subject matter. The verse showed the anger and frustration that must have been playing Steez right before his death. It's hard for me to describe, but you could just hear it in his voice. He sounds like he's done, fed up with the way things have been going and whatever other issues he was going through at this time. Last Straw is a fitting title for this song and what it represents for Steez in the final days of his life. He would drop lines like, and let this be the last straw I'm sick and tired of having to sneak in through the back door Scratch that, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired How you not gonna give me mine every time I rip a line I haven't seen the limelight and I write mine Rappers have based their whole careers off of white lies The line about him sneaking through the back door is according to Genius A direct reference to a situation at one of Steve's last shows Where he was denied access to the backstage area because the security guard didn't believe he was actually Capital Steez. Thus he had to sneak past security through the back door and subsequently being late to that show. This situation shows that in some instances he wasn't really treated with the respect of an up and coming rapper as he was actually starting to make moves at this point. Also, this last verse displays Steez venting his frustrations about the music industry and other rappers basing their careers off of lies, not having any type of quality to their music too. One line that stands out to me is when he says, I think I'm losing sight of the game, call me Ray Charles, which I interpret as Steve's just being completely done with hip hop, the music industry, and everything that comes with that lifestyle. Which is honestly such a shame seeing Steve's being so disillusioned with the thing that was once his dream and passion. At one point he was very passionate about hip hop and rapping, as he would go on and on about the smallest aspects about it as seen on his appearance on the NYU student radio, but something got lost along the way. Last Jar is a song I personally don't go back to much, as it shows Steez's palpable anger, frustrated with the world and venting this bluntly. Everything about this verse, from the subject matter to his delivery, screams that he's done with it all, done with everything, and his tragic actions, just five days later, would show the extent of how this was affecting him. The night that the Pro Era mixtape peep dropped, Stuzzy would also drop a collaboration with Pro Era, selling multiple shirts and hoodies with various designs on it. This is a big deal, as I've never really heard of rappers collaborating with clothing brands when they're still relatively new to the game. But the Pro Era crew would make an appearance at the Stuzzy store in Manhattan the day the collab dropped, which was the same day that their mixtape Peep dropped as well. According to Steez's sister, Tamara, in her own words, she would go on to say, quote, Steez didn't even want to go until some of the pros came to pick Steez up at his apartment. So while really not feeling it, Steez would still show up to the event. There was a big line of people waiting to cop merch and meet the members of Pro Era. Everyone was there and while the other members of Pro Era were having a good time and celebrating this milestone in their careers, Steez's mood never really seemed to brighten up that night. Apparently Steez blew up when somebody asked him to sign a t-shirt and no one brought him a sharpie. Hype Track TV would also notably upload a vlog of the Stuzzy event onto their YouTube channel giving us deeper insight into what happened that night. Looking at the video, it clearly shows the juxtaposition of everyone like Joey, CJ, Powers, and Dirty Sanchez celebrating having a good time, while Steez honestly doesn't look well, as he seems disassociated and detached from the event and his friends. When speaking, he was slurring his words, seemingly in a daze with his eyes half open. He even spoke briefly with the vlogger, and it's just so sad to see Steez in this state. And keep in mind, this was only two days before his death. <laughs> Another video from this night shows Steve briefly speaking that further shows him in this tragic state. Let's 
this is the, uh, he's got this, this B tape, whatever. Uh, you all know? Yeah. Keep the apocalypse stuff. Yeah. I like to note that all the designs said Joey Badass and the Progressive Era on it, sticking with the theme of Joey being perceived as the head and face of Pro Era. Also, his sister Tamara told the Fader article that Steve's had a conversation with their mother that day, and Steve's was worried about the 47 sticker being investigated by the NYPD. She would tell the Fader that Steve's would even go on to say, quote, the only way he would get rid of that whole situation was if he hurt himself, with Steez's mother adamantly shutting this down, telling her son, no, 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 you know we can't do that. According to this same article, the next night Steez was with other members of Pro Era at Premier Studios. This was the studio that Cinematic was using at the time. And one of the people who was present that night, who remained anonymous in the article, says that Steez told some of the pros he was thinking about killing himself by jumping off of the building where Cinematic had its offices. The Pros would actually try to toss some sense into him and talk him out of it. But Dirty Sanchez will tell the fader nothing was working, nothing. It was too late. He already made up his mind. <music> Apparently the day after this, Steez was home all day, but would eventually leave the house that night. Steez's mother had fallen asleep thinking that her son was home. The details of what happened the night of Steez's death is scarce, but from what research I've done, it seems that his friends were trying to get in contact with him that night to no avail. According to the article MTV would write reporting on Steez's death, Nick Carson would send a tweet out looking for his friend at around 10 p.m. that night, saying, quote, at Capital Steez, where you at? It seems after failing to get in contact with Steez, some members of Pro Era would go to Steez's mother's apartment looking for him. They showed up at the apartment waking up Steez's mother and sisters. This is when his family would find out that their son and younger brother was missing. Shortly after this, Mrs. Duar would call the suicide hotline. And according to the Fader article, police reports would show a call was placed at around 12.15 a.m. Linda Hansen, who was living in LA at the time, called Dirty Sanchez as the worry about Steez's whereabouts would spread. She adamantly told them to go to Prospect Park and soon after this, Dirty Sanchez sped out with a friend where they met the rest of the pros at Prospect Park. He told the fitter that they were in the dark and cold park for about an hour and a half looking for Steez, where they all shouted for Steez to no response. While the pro era crew were out in Brooklyn looking relentlessly for their friend, Steez's family would contact the NYPD and soon, a detective would show up at their apartment. They would give a detective pictures of Steez just in case they saw him, but tragically at this point, it was already too late. Steez was granted access to the building where Cinematic Music Group kept their offices. This was due to the fact that Steez counted as an employee. This was a place where Pro Era once laughed, joked, smoked weed, and sharpened their skills as rappers. We'll never know what was going through Steez's mind on that roof on a cold December night, but at around 11.54 Eastern Standard Time, Steez would text one of his friends, Cheryl, saying, I love you. Just four minutes later, at 11.59 Eastern Standard Time, Steez would send out his last tweet, simply writing, The End. Moments later, while clutching a Bible to his chest, Steez would jump off that same building, resulting in his death. It's reported that he propelled himself so far that he landed in the street. Capital Steez would pass away at the young age of 19 years old, with his whole life ahead of him. He didn't leave a note, and the day he passed, December 23rd, 2012, would add up to the number 47. A few hours later, cops would go to Steez's family's apartment with the tragic news that their son and younger brother's body was found outside of that very building in Manhattan. News was spread quickly to Steez's friends and his fellow Beast Coast members, and in the days following Steez's death, the hip-hop world would react. Most of these tweets have since been deleted, but from what I found, Chuck Strangers would write, quote, Rest in peace to my homie Steez, I love you bro. AK the Savior from the Underachievers would write in disbelief, quote, I can't believe this shit, what the fuck, shaking my head. Zombie Juice from Flappa Zombies would simply write, This is sad news with a sad face emoji. But from multiple sources, I was able to find Joey Badass's reaction to Steez's untimely death, where he would write things like, This unfortunate Christmas Eve lost a best friend, a brother, a pro, a partner. Letting go is never easy. May your soul rest in peace, Jamal. He would also write, Rest in peace, capital Steez. 7793 to 122412 12. and things like sick to my stomach and it hasn't been the same since my homie's death which is a line directly from Steez coming from infinity and beyond but aside from members of Beast Coast other figures in hip-hop would tweet out about capital Steez 
showing love to him and sending condolences to his friends and family. People like the legendary DJ Premier, Knife Wonder, Currency, Action Bronson, Smoke Dizza, and Reggie Snow would all tweet out, paying their respects to Steve's. The Fader points out that the next day, on Christmas of 2012, members of Pro Era and close friends would go to Mrs. Duar's house to pay their respects. After asking someone to play Steez's song, Stars, which is a heartfelt song that Steez dedicated to his mother and was a song about Steez chasing his hip-hop dreams, the meeting soon became tense. As Steez's mother broke down, and according to Stilo's friend, Linda Hansen, Mrs. Duar soon began to question the members of Pro Era, bombarding them with questions like, when was the last time they saw or heard from Steez? Who was last with him? Why was it the family alerted when the signs were becoming clear that something was wrong in the last couple of days of his life? Tamara, his sister, will tell the Fader that the family were not satisfied with the answers that they were given. But I would like some of you guys to keep in mind that most of the pros were either teenagers or just coming into adulthood, and action could have admittedly been taken to prevent Steve from harming himself, but we've all made lapses of judgments when we were kids, and this must have been very traumatic for the pros, his family, and his friends to deal with. In a lot of respects, the death of Capital Steves has left us with more questions than answers. Many have pointed out that there was a lack of reporting outside of the hip hop world, which is strange considering a buzzing Brooklyn rapper would take his own life in the Flatiron District of Manhattan could be seen as newsworthy by many. One of Steez's best friends, Jack the Rhymer, would even tell the Fader, quote, it kind of says something about America that a black kid could die in the middle of New York City and no one would know what the fuck happened. To say that Jack had a point would be an understatement. Only a handful of hip-hop publications and forums would report and discuss Steez's death shortly after it happened, and the information that was available in these articles was scarce. As aside from career highlights, these articles didn't say much in regards of what actually happened that night. Another fact that would add a layer of mystery as to what really happened was the fact that Tamara would tell the Fader article that the funeral home wouldn't let Steez's family see his body. This was due to the fact that they believed that showing his family the body would be too devastating for them. So instead, the funeral home would show them pictures. I couldn't understand this considering the way Steez passed, it couldn't have been a pleasant sight. But in the same breath, seeing his body would have given his family much needed closure. According to that same article, a police officer was following Steez around, which could have had something to do with the 47 sticker still being under investigation, and maybe gave Steez an added sense of paranoia. But with the lack of information and the absence of facts surrounding the case, combined with Steez's deep spiritual beliefs and anti-establishment leanings, this has led to much speculation and conspiracy theories. The years following Steez's death, there has been a number of videos coming out sharing these sentiments about his death. There were videos stating that Steve was killed, that he was an Illuminati sacrifice for Joey Badass. As Illuminati sacrifices are seen as a common conspiracy with many people holding this belief, usually having multiple examples throughout the years to prove this. There would also be videos alleging that Joey had something to do with Steve's death. There was even a video made that alleged that fellow New York rapper ASAP Rocky had something to do with it as they both took pictures with American flag, among other things, being quote, evidence of this. Even the fact that some close friends of Steve's are willing to entertain the fact that Steve's may have not taken his own life adds a layer of mystery to Steve's death that's quite frankly alluring. In the years following Steve's death, due to his deep spiritual knowledge and insights, Many on comment sections and on forums would conclude that Steve was killed because he knew too much and could really change the world in a significant way. There's no doubt that in Steve's short life he made a significant impact and could have made a bigger one had he been alive, but in my humble opinion the conspiracy theories are just that, conspiracies. I can see why people would jump to the conclusion that Steve was murdered, but many fans see Steve as a larger than life figure and quite frankly seeing him as a prophet. But in reality he was a young man coming into his own but seemingly had demons he was dealing with and couldn't fully grapple with. He was just a kid, just 19 years old, but he did have deep knowledge and curiosity. There are a multitude of things that led to Steve's untimely death and I think to put it on conspiracy theories or even say that Joey Badass was somehow responsible is misguided and just not right. However, I will say aside from the conspiracy theories, some have theorized that Steve was going through weed-induced psychosis as he was an avid pothead, or maybe he had some sort of undiagnosed mental illness. Joey Badass pointed out on the therapist on Vice 
that Steez may have shown some symptoms of this. Like no one really understanding Steez when he talked or even when he looked at Joey during the last days of his life. It was like he was looking through Joey, like something else was there. With Joey telling the therapist, quote, like closer to his death, there were days where I would just look him in his eyes and he was looking past me. He's not looking at anything that was here or he's not looking at me, he's looking through me. The therapist would tell Joey that he believes that Steez was in touch with the spirit realm at the time of his death, with Joey adding that he thinks that Steez may have believed that he was dreaming at the time of his death, which could be the case as in cases of drug induced psychosis, hallucinations are one of the main symptoms and we truly cannot know if Steez was hallucinating or in touch with another dimension. Side note, it's important to know that the CIA would actually investigate the spirit realm through Operation Gateway. These files have been declassified in 2016, but to summarize, they found that the spirit realm is real and that you could visit this realm through astral projection, with Robert Monroe being the key figure in this investigation. I bring this up because while there were a myriad of things playing in Steve's mind, it's possible that if he was really experimenting with astral projection, this could have been too much for him to handle and he may have literally lost touch with reality. People who have experimented with astral projection and even psychedelics say that you should be really careful with this as there's people who have done these things and have never been the same since. I don't know for sure but this may have been a contributing factor to what happened with Steez. I thought it was at least worth mentioning. I linked a video from What If Altis that explains the CIA investigation in depth for those who are interested. So nothing has been definitively confirmed as there's a lack of information on what happened with Steez that day. But in an attempt to find some answers and shed some light on the conspiracy surrounding his death, these were some of the theories that have been circulating in the years following Steez's death. But there was a project that Steez allegedly finished before his death and was announced in 2013. But over 10 years later, it has faced numerous delays, with many online debating whether or not we will ever see this album called King Capital. Before getting into the topic, I want to say that a number of Steve songs have surfaced in the years following his death. Some of these may have been on King Capital. Now King Capital is a project that Steez has mentioned on several occasions, but not by name. He mentioned it on one of his last interviews the day of his last show, and I remember going through his Twitter years ago and seeing him talk about finishing a project the month of his death. His Twitter has since been taken down, so I have no way of really verifying it right now. But the first mention of King Capital from the Pro Era camp would come in April of 2013, when Joey Badass would tell Hip Hop DX that he was working on his first album before the money and would confirm that a Capital Steve's posthumous album or tape was coming out real soon. On July 7, 2013, on Steve's birthday, Pro Era would release the song King Capital that had this amazing flu sample and a very catchy chorus, which could show that Steve was stepping up his game for King Capital. This song is apparently from the Poshmas mixtape, and for years King Capital would yet to be released. I remember hearing around this time that Joy wanted to be in a high position in the rap game to put out the album, so that King Capital would get the attention it deserves. This was mostly in comment sections, but this makes a lot of sense to me, as it would ensure that Steez's last known project would get a lot of exposure. It's important to note at this time, there was no release date set in stone. It was just known that King Capital was in the vault and would eventually be released. But it was around this time that Pro Era would host their first Steez Day. This wasn't a concert, but instead a get together of family, friends, and fans at Prospect Park in Brooklyn. The turnout was a lot larger than expected, and I was actually supposed to go to this, but I was too young to drive at the time. The next year, the Pro Era camp would decide to turn it into a show, and they held their first annual Steez Day concert on July 7, 2015, and it would turn into an annual event, similar to Yams Day that the ASAP crew holds every year. The next year's lineup was actually held in LA this time around, and I forgot to mention that every year all the proceeds and merch sales would go to the Duar family. I was actually at the first and last Steez Day shows that was held in Central Park, and it was a great experience, but it was at Steez Day 2017 beside Steez's family that Joey Badass would announce that the album would be released on December 23rd, 2017, the fifth anniversary of Steez's death. They could have seen this as the right time considering that Joey Badass just dropped his highly acclaimed album All American Badass earlier that year. Also the month before on June 12th, 2017, Capital Steez's Twitter account was hacked and someone tweeted the beginning, but at the time no one knew it was hacked and this spurred heavy speculation that King Capital was finally coming out. But the tweet was deleted and a Eventually, this would lead to Capital Steez's personal Twitter being deactivated, which just sucks as his Twitter would have given us much deeper insight from my research. 
But eventually, Joey Badass would go on Instagram to tell the fans that the album would be delayed due to business legalities and sample clearances. But the next year, an article would come out that would unfortunately seal the fate of King Capital and the annual Steez Day concerts. It's hard to find a chronological timeline of the events that took place, but sometime in December of 2018, an article would drop from DigitalDivision.co.uk that would essentially show Tamara airing out her grievances against the pro era camp for several things, like not being properly compensated or consulted for some Steez Day concerts, Pro Era making money off the 47 logo, and the Third Eye Crown logo that has become synonymous with Steez, taking down his Facebook, taking his computer, and allegedly only giving Steez's family a CD with some of his unreleased material. Now there was a Hello You Seen video from back in the day that shows the order of events, but since that video isn't up anymore, and other articles don't explain exactly what happened in the order of events, it's hazy exactly what happened. But eventually Joey Badass and Tamara will end up having a back and forth on Instagram that for the life of me I'm unable to piece together as there's only screenshots of only bits and pieces of their conversations online. But Joey Badass adamantly shut down the things alleged by that article that was actually written by a Stan account. I only know this because at the time I followed said Stan account. But Joey would discredit the article by saying that no major publications would entertain the things said and that why would she represent the whole family when no one else is backing her up. Also, Joey would mention how he invited the family to his baby shower too, showing that there was still love between them. Eventually, another one of Steez's sisters would put out a statement on Instagram saying, quote, An agreement proposal sent on 824.17 has delayed King Cabell for almost six years, which if true means that the agreement proposal, assuming it was between Pro Era and Steez's estate, was sent after, which honestly added to the confusion. Around this time, Joey Badass dropped his own statement on Instagram, simply saying that he would have dropped King Capital years ago if it was up to him, but the estate owns his music and that Capital Steez's mother has the final say. But being accused of stealing money from the Duar family at Steez Day would leave a bitter taste in his mouth and Pro Era would discontinue the annual event, with the last Steez Day being in 2018. But Joey Badass would mirror the same sentiment on his Instagram statement four years later in an interview with Anthony Fantano. He would also emphasize the fact that no one wants to see King Capital out more than him. Joey Badass would go on to say that he's done a lot to try to get the music out, but it's not in his hands. He also goes on to say that he tried to help the family get the music out years ago through Pro Era, and that the split would have been 90% towards the Duar family and 10% towards Joey, only because Joey had to hire staff to get stuff done like clear samples, and that it would make sense to do it with Joey considering they were close friends, but something got lost along the way. I've done so much to try to get the project out, mm. right? It's not in my hands. I don't own Steez's music. Yeah. Steez was never signed to me as an artist, and that was never the plan. Yeah. So that was never my intention. You know what I mean? I tried to help the family get the music out years ago. You know what I mean? I was going to put it out through Pro Era Ventures that I had going, and the split was 90%, 10%. Hmm. I wanted to keep that 10%, not for profit, but because I had to hire staffs I had to hire people to help me get things done. You got to clear samples. You got to do all of that stuff. So that was me trying to provide a safety net for myself. So I'm not taking the loss. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But 90% go all to the family. Like, you know, that was the agreement that got lost and convoluted somewhere. And since then, I've backed off because I gave them the music and I said, yo, y'all don't got to do this with me. Like, this is, I just thought that that is what y'all want to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, I thought, you know, you guys could trust me. Like, I'm home team. You feel me? Like, let, let nobody go and fight for y'all like how I'm going to fight for y'all. I'm going to get the best situation. You know what I'm saying? But cool. If y'all don't want me to be that guy, then I won't be that guy. Here's the music and let me know whatever help y'all need. Y'all need to be introduced to certain people, whatever. I will set that shit up. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, I got a lot of sympathy, empathy, love, and respect for his family to this day because I know them. You know what I'm saying? They are like, and expect like you know, with, with his mom's like his mom's is an older generation Jamaican lady. You know what I'm saying? And it's like they don't vibe with the internet shit. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't like that's not part of their culture. Like all of this shit, this music industry shit. Like this is this is some fucking devil shit to them. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't want nothing to really do with this. So it's like, I understand that, but it's like the perception is so jaded and it's like, 
nobody is fighting for me. And that's cool. I'm a grown ass man. I'll stand on my own too. I'll take whatever to the chin. I've been taking it for fucking years. I've been taking all of the darts, all of the spears, yet I'm the one putting in the highest amount of contribution to try to make everything right. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it is. It's like, yo, I can't put out King Capital. If I could have put out King Capital, I, I would have put it out years ago. Like, right. are you fucking insane? Like, what the fuck do I get out of holding on to it? Mm-hmm. What do I get? If I could have been in control of Steezy's estate, I would have put out King Capital, American Corruption Reloaded, the whole thing would have been on streaming platforms. Like, yo, my man is not even in the marketplace. That kills me every day because I know how much fucking money is being missed out on. That should be going to his family's hands. Like, it's his legacy. People are bootlegging shit, making money off of his back. That should be going to the fan. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, bro, I think about that shit often. It's like, yo, the fact that I can't even, like, again, back to the streaming world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, if this shit shut out, I got no way to listen to my man's music. Right. No fucking way. So, yeah, man, like, that's that. You know, that I, hopefully that answered every question for everybody out there. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, I like... I don't care though, you know what I'm saying? Like motherfuckers could think whatever because motherfuckers don't know me. Mm -hmm. Motherfuckers never met me, never sat down, had a conversation with me. They don't even know who I am. So it's like, how could you judge a person you don't even know? You know what I'm saying? How could you assume things about a person you don't even know? Mm -hmm. I appreciate the extra clarity. Yeah, no doubt. I feel like it was necessary. It seems that Joey Badass really wanted King Capital to come out already and is upset at the fact that it still has yet to come out and that the rest of his music isn't even on streaming platforms to this day, aside from bootleggers. The situation seemed to be that Steve may have rapped over some unoriginal beats and Joey Badass was going to help with sample clearances or get these songs on new beats. From the outside looking in, it's possible that the pro era camp and Steve's family could not come up with a proper agreement with a revenue split or other things too. And now that Joey Joey Badass isn't involved in the process, King Capital has been in a state of limbo for over 10 years now. It's a damn shame that King Capital hasn't come out yet, not only because I'm a fan and would love to hear his final work, but Steez was one of the first rappers of his generation that passed away before his time. And in the past five years or so, there have been so many rappers who unfortunately have shared the same fate, but their final work has been released within a year of their deaths. Rappers like Pop Smoke, X, Lil Peep, Mac Miller, King Von, and Juice World all had their posthumous albums come out, and we have yet to hear King Capital, which can be frustrating for fans to see. And I hope that things change, man, but only time will tell. With the death of Capital Steez, Pro Era was honestly never the same. I couldn't find which article Joey Badass said this in, but my brother told me he remembers Joey Badass saying that Summer Nights was intended to be a pro era mixtape, but the rest of the pros were so unmotivated that it never came to be. In the years following Steez's death, Pro Era would release two more projects, that being the 7 track tape, the S tape 2, that had some great songs on it like Far and Soul Luna, and the shift that was presented by Sion AV. But it seems after dropping those two group projects in 2014, Pro Era really wouldn't exist as a cohesive unit anymore. It seems like Capital Steez may have been the one keeping Pro Era together. That and losing someone so close to you can have a deep effect on a person and their motivation. I could speak to this as I was working on this video when my father suddenly passed away and it took me two months to get the motivation to get up and continue the process of making this. Grief affects everyone differently and it seems that as more time passed by, the members of Pro Era started to focus on their solo careers and as a group they've been mostly inactive. Hell, members even started leaving Pro Era like Diamond Lewis, Tina Apex, and Swagmaster Raw. But members like Kirk Knight, CJ Fly, Nick Carson, and Dirty Sanchez will all end up dropping solo music consistently and seeing success, getting up to hundreds of thousands of plays on Spotify. Pro Era would even regroup as a label, with Pro Era Records being created in 2015. But Chuck Strangers ended up finding his stride collaborating with the newer wave of underground rappers like Pink Saifu, Fly Anakin, Navy Blue, and Young Morpheus. Rappers like Dirty Sanchez, Jab, Rocka, and Jack the Rhymer, who were very close with Steez, commonly called themselves the 47s, keeping Steez's concept alive. 
Howard's Pleasant, one of Pro Era's founders, would see a large amount of success as a producer, collaborating with his fellow Beast Coast rappers and other rappers like Denzel Curry, Zillakami, IDK, Buddy, and ASAP Ferg. Kirk Knight would also see a large amount of success as a producer, mainly producing the hit by ASAP Ferg, Plain Jane, among many others. Joey Badass would arguably see the most amount of success as a rapper, as he consistently dropped critically acclaimed albums throughout the 2010s. Seeing success with albums like Before the Money, the politically charged All-American Badass that was released on 4-7, which could be a nod to Steez. He also started having more big name features like Schoolboy Q and J. Cole being on his albums. He also dropped his sequel to 1999 called 2000 which achieved a great amount of success. Joey Badass would go on to have an illustrious career with quality music and even straight up hits with songs like Devastated, Temptation, and Love Is Only A Feeling. He would see career highs that would see him be compared to rappers like J.I.D., Denzel Curry, Kendrick Lamar, and J. Cole, with him being considered one of the best MCs of his generation. He would even dive deep into acting with the award-winning short film Two Distant Strangers, an appearance on Mr. Robot, Wu-Tang and American Saga, and a lead role on Raising Canaan. But aside from the Fader article and certain interviews, Pro Era would not talk about Steve for a number of years as his loss was deeply traumatic for his friends in Pro Era. In 2013, Joey Badass would drop Summer Nights that had the heartfelt ode to Capital Steve's title Long Live Stilo, where he talked about how much Steve's influenced him as a rapper and a person, and dropping less than a year after his death, Joey would rap about how much Steez's death affected him. He would also discuss Steez putting him on to new age spirituality in his practices as well. The song would see two of Stilo's songs, Negus and 47 Elephants, be interpolated for the chorus. But in 2022, one of the lead singles for his album, 2000, was the song Survivor's Guilt that showed Joey Badass deeply explored the deaths of his best friend Capital Steez and his day-to-day -day manager who was also his cousin named Junior B who passed away in 2014. The song opens up with sections of dialogue from Steez's appearance on the NYU student podcast back in 2012 where he talks about American corruption and how he came up with the concept while finding himself. The first verse shows Joey Badass exploring his relationship with Steez and how they both heavily influenced each other while showing deep introspection with lines like, now I'm rich and rotten, every day I think about him, it's survivor's guilt, and other lines like, then I caught a little wave and headed back to shore and that's when he started drowning and he had no one so partially. I felt it was my fault. These lines show that in spite of the great amount of success that Joey has achieved, the death of his best friend still deeply affects him and that he was so high off the success of 1999, he didn't fully grasp what Steve was going through and he may still blame himself for that. He would also speak on his own spirituality and how Steve learned as fast as possible and wanted to go real deep with knowledge but Joey wanted to take his time in that realm. Joey Badass would also address the Duar family and express how after they tried to lie on him, he couldn't fuck with them. And all he really wants is to have Steez's final project, King Capital, be heard. Lastly, he would address the people who think he has something to do with Steez's death. It was a truly heartfelt song that really showed fans how deeply this affects Joey and even showed his perspective on the matter. Although the rappers of Pro Era would focus on their solo careers with varying degrees of success, I like to say that being a solo rapper isn't as easy as you have to be captivating enough to hold the interest of a listener for a whole tape or album, which is not easy. You also have to have great hooks, which not every rapper can master. Essentially, my point is, not every rapper is meant to be a solo rapper, and groups are a good way for everyone to eat. Because if you look at crews and collectives throughout the history of hip hop, there's usually a handful of them that see solo success. Just look at Wu-Tang, Odd Future, and the Fugees. But aside from Pro Era, groups like the Underachievers and Flappers Zombies would go on to see major success as well, with Beast Coast overall having a big part in the sound and style of hip hop in the early 2010s. The Underachievers dropped their classic mixtape, Indigoism, in 2013, that had some of my favorite hip hop songs on it, and had a big emphasis on the new wave spirituality that defined much of Capital Steve's music, which makes me think about the collaborations that could have happened had this tragedy not taken place. Indigoism would have a more cloud rap style, mixing bangers with rapid fire flows and more traditional boom bass songs too. The Underachievers would drop consistently throughout the 2010s with the highlight being the very underrated Evermore The Art of Duality that had a lot of introspective songs on it. But they would eventually put the duo on hold with AK The Savior and Issa Gold dropping solo projects throughout the 2020s. Flapper Zombies would arguably be the biggest group in Beast Coast dropping classic mixtapes like Drugs and Better Off Dead that makes traditional hip hop with spacey, drugged out, psychedelic trap beats that also has some of my favorite songs and hip hop on it. 
Their early work would feature unique sample choices, but Meech's signature rappy off-kilter flow caught everyone's attention and would prove to be highly successful. They dropped two quality albums with 3001, A Laced Odyssey, and Vacation in Hell, but the members would go on to drop their own solo projects as well. It's crazy to think how much success Beast Coast and Pro Era saw after coming into the game in 2012, and that they thrived together based on a movement that Steez himself formed. I think they would have seen success regardless, but being associated with each other meant that Phantom Joey would automatically check out new tapes from Flappin' Zombies or the Underachievers, and vice versa. Also, in 2018, Beast Coast would come out with an album called Escape from New York, which was honestly kind of underwhelming. There were some good songs on it, but it was a little messy as it seems that everyone was trying to squeeze in verses, with not many lines between the rappers. Many, including myself, thought that it would be more like the incredible Clockwork Indigo tape with the Underachievers and Flappa Zombies, or the song Did You Ever Think that featured members of Flappa Zombies, the Underachievers, and Joey Badass on it. These songs had longer verses and gave everyone time to shine, while the verses just weren't as well crafted on the Beast Coast album in my opinion. The Beast Coast album was still enjoyable and we still got the legendary Beast Coast Cypher, so that's a plus. But overall, the Beast Coast album could have been delivered a little better. But it's a shame that Pro Era really hasn't done anything as a cohesive unit in about 10 years, seeing as they all had an incredible amount of chemistry on tracks together, as seen on Peep. And I hope one day they'll come back together and do a proper project together, but only time will tell. The success that the whole of Beast Coast was able to achieve in the past 12 years has been incredible to see. It's just a shame that Steez couldn't be a part of it. With all that being said, Capital Steez was someone who started rapping at a very young age, and as he grew older, his skills as a rapper would skyrocket. Capital Steez was someone from the age of 15 who could come up with layered punchlines and multi-syllable rhyme schemes while spinning it with confidence and always with a smile. He would freestyle wherever he could and was always quick to get a reaction when he would show off his wordplay abilities. Steez never really saw himself becoming a full-time rapper until becoming close with fellow Brooklyn rapper Joey Badass where the ambition that Joey had would rub off on Stilo. Steez was a person who was deeply curious about the world around him and his place in it. Seeing the reality of being a black man in America trying to survive made him dig deeper and he would eventually learn about the new age spirituality that would define much of his music. He was a visionary and a leader who helped form Pro Era and Beast Coast, two movements that would have a great impact on hip hop, as their music would help define the blog era of the early 2010s. Steve was inspired by the fact that he was learning about deep spirituality and wanted to make a positive impact on the world. He met like-minded individuals and put his fellow Pro Era members onto this knowledge. He would create the concept for 47 that would represent balance in the world as it represented the tension between the heart and the mind that plagues us as humans. But seeing his friend who was younger than him reach stardom and be given opportunities of a lifetime while he was struggling to find a buzz could have possibly been too much for him to handle. He could have carved out a lane for himself for sure and I could have seen Steve being a king of the underground easily fitting in with rappers like Earl Sweatshirt, Maxo, Weeki, and Blue, who found their footing not compromising their sound, but still having a dedicated fan base. But Stilo's spirituality would take a dark turn as he identified with the Batman and started to become disillusioned with the industry. It seems that Steez began to lose hope and even his grasp on reality. The lack of answers surrounding his death has sparked many theories to try to figure out why this rapper with so much potential would take his own life. Theories include tensions with Joey, undiagnosed mental illness, weed to do psychosis, things from his past like losing his father getting to him, him starting to get deep into shrooms and astral projection, and possibly being in touch with the spirit world. But in spite of many theories, we'll never truly know what led to Steve's death. It may have been a combination of these factors that led to him taking his own life. But whatever it was, it was too much for him. Capital Steve's was quite frankly a prodigy, spinning at a level of veterans in hip hop at only 19 years old and influencing everyone around him. Whether it was to become a better rapper, a better person, learn about spirituality and the chakras, Steez had a deep impact on those he came into contact with in his short life. Steez even influenced people like me to start learning more about spirituality, start meditating, and even questioning the world around them. He influenced many to rap and rap about the topics that they were passionate about in spite of what was hot at the moment because that's exactly what Steez did. Steez will always be remembered as a great person and a great rapper whose potential, unfortunately, was never truly realized. Fans still listen to the music he did release and even get tattoos dedicated to him. So in spite of his short career, 
Capital Steve's truly left an impact on many. May he rest in peace. Ain't no time for faking, Jack. Ain't no time for faking. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for sticking around this long. If you guys made it this far, I really appreciate that, guys. But with that being said, I'm going to be coming out with more videos real soon. So make sure you like, comment, subscribe, all that type of stuff. And I'll see you in the next video coming real soon. Y'all going to want to check it out. Thanks.